It's the fourth day of the week. Welcome right here on the AM show on Joy News. And this is Benjamin Akakwan, as always, and kept in good company with Bernice Applebeat Lancer. We serve you this morning, as always. The news will bring you away shortly, but right after that, we'll be joined by Vera Haibo, parliamentary aspirant for Hawaii. She is our guest. And then the big stories, two topical issues we're focusing on today. The public interest and accountability report for 2022 shows that for two consecutive years, 2021 and 2022, the Ministry of Finance was not able to transfer money from the APFA to the District Assembly Common Fund. Now, now PIAC reiterates that government should direct disbursements to the GIIF intended for Agenda 111 to the Ministry of Health as well. We'll be giving you all of those details uh, this morning as we speak to the Vice Chair of uh, the PIAC, Alpha Mohammed. Well, also on the show, we joined the Ghana National Fire Service as it celebrates 60 years of existence in Ghana. The other day, they joined us right here in the studio. Well, today, the service is honoring its veterans. And we'll be hearing from the chief fireman himself on the show. Later on the show as well, you'd have the chance to join us with your views via phone and on social media. In fact, via the live stream with your messages. So keep us company as we inform you, give you the finest of morning television. Up next, the news. Let's settle for the news now. And in our first story, taxi drivers operating here in the capital, Accra, will in the coming months be migrated to a ride-hailing app as part of efforts to digitize the operations of commercial drivers. Now, Vice President Dr. Mohamedou Baumia, who announced this, said the initiative arose out of complaints by taxi drivers that their businesses were being taken over by ride-hailing companies. Addressing a conference of the Pentecost Church of Ghana, Dr. Baumia said the service would also be extended to Trotro and other commercial vehicles by the end of the year. We'll bring you the visuals on that uh, later. But in our next story, government says it hopes to receive the needed assurances from the Paris Club to pave the way for an IMF bailout. The lack of a clear assurance from the Paris Club over Ghana's external debt restructuring program is the stumbling block to Ghana accessing a $3 billion loan from the IMF. Now, speaking to journalists in Parliament, Deputy Finance Minister Dr. John Kuma said he couldn't give deadlines, but the assurances were close. Um, the Minister of Finance just returned from the springboard meeting in the U.S. Uh, he took opportunity to meet our bilateral partners and multilateral partners. I can say that we are very, very hopeful that uh, we will secure the... Paris Club uh, financing assurances within the shortest possible time. I'm unable to give timelines, but I can assure you discussions are going very, very well. And very, very soon, Ghana will hear the good news. Well, let's take you back now to that initial story about taxi drivers and their complaints and uh, the announcement of the Vice President about their being migrated to a ride-hailing app. A long time, a long, about almost a year ago, taxi drivers came to see me in my office. And one of their major problems that they presented to me and my team, they said, look, our business, our business is collapsing. And I said, what is the problem? They said, now we have Uber. And many people are not taking taxis as before. You know, people want to feel safer and for other reasons, so they would rather call Uber and bring us. So uh, Uber is taking our business. So how can you help us? So we sat down with my team and said, okay, how do we help our taxi drivers compete with the Uber drivers so that they can also be like Uber. So we set the team to work. 
And so the task was to digitize the operations of our no regular taxis, just as you have with Uber. I'm happy to say that that work has now been completed. And in the next couple of months, we will be able to place our taxis, at least in Greater Accra to start with, all on an Uber-like platform. And you'll be able to call them just like you call Ubers to your homes and all of that. It's a practical solution to a practical problem. And that's the sort of thing we, as politicians, should be focusing on, dealing with problems of our people. And there's more actually coming, but this is not the forum. I think we are attacking everybody. Trotros <laughs> will come later on. VIP buses, Ayalolo, Metro Mass. The whole public sector is going to go on, and private sector transport is going to go on what we call a tap and go system. It's, when you go to England, they have the oyster, oyster car that you travel with. Ghana is also going to have an oyster card before the end of this year. Now, the Chief Justice, His Lordship Justice Enin Yabwa, has called on the judicial service workers in the OT region to deliver justice with integrity. According to him, the value of integrity and effective justice delivery cannot be taken for granted. The Chief Justice made the remarks when he inaugurated a district court in Kijibi. distinguished guests, as we shower tons of applause, permit me also to use this occasion to admonish them. That is my staff, judges, judicial officers, officers in the registrar, great court clerks, and all officers, officers at the courts, including the translator, the bailiff, that they owe this nation a great responsibility. Indeed, you have a much higher calling to dispense justice without fear or fever, affection or a will, which together with righteousness is the foundation of the integrity of court. To me, it is an honor to be entrusted with the administration of justice, however brief, and this is undoubtedly an enormous responsibility. I dare say emphatically that the value of integrity in effective justice delivery cannot be downplayed. It influences and promotes peace, stability, and trust in any society, thus creating an enabling environment for fruitful conduct of business for development. Men and women of integrity are disciplined and honest. And there are people who work hard and are highly productive. There are people who need to be who need not to be reminded of their responsibilities. They do not need a boss to keep an eye on them before they do what is right and what is expected of them. Integrity is therefore the most important character trait needed for an efficient and effective service for building a good reputation for an institution, endangering trust and securing a bright future for our nation. In our next story, the chairperson of the National Commission on Civic Education, Kathleen Addy, is asking for a new narrative where politicians who preach violence are not rewarded. She says this is important as Ghana prepares for another major election. She's been speaking at the launch of the National Constitution Week at Sagnerigu in the Northern Region. The National Constitution Week was instituted in 2001 to commemorate the return of Ghana to a democratic rule. To mark this year's celebration, several activities were held, including the education of the masses on their civic responsibilities. Speaking at the launch in Tamale, chairperson of the NCCE, Kathleen Abe said, politicians who create division should not be voted into power. And so what we have now, which is Peace and security is the thing that we cannot put a price on. And we must strive and do our best to keep the peace and security of this country in all that we do. Other things that challenge that are a challenge for our democracy are things like um, politics of discord and disunity and divisiveness. We are about to go into the political season. And already we are seeing the signs of uh, politicians trying to be divisive, threatening, issuing threats and all of that. We must have a new political narrative where we the people will not reward such politicians by electing them.
matter to ensure that the politics serve us. Politics is an engine of the democracy that we are practicing. We cannot do away with it, but it must serve us. We must not be enslaved by the politics of the people. The Northern Regional Minister Shani Al Hassan Shaibu commended the NCC work in deepening the country's democracy. Now, Chairman, through these 30 years of this constitutional governance, Ghana has made giant strides in consolidating democracy. Prominent among them include periodic elections and peaceful change of government over the period. The 1998 batch of the Awudu Messenia High School has handed over an ultra-modern information communication technology laboratory to its alma mater. Now, the lab, equipped with 80 computers and a virtual teaching and learning facility, is expected to enhance training in ICT and improve the general performance of students. There's more in this report put together by Fred Kwabiasari. The Awudo Messenia High School in the whole West District of the Volta region has a student population of about 2,000. The school previously relied on privately owned and a resourced ICT lab for studies. This created a lot of inconveniences which affected teaching and learning due to the inadequacy of computers. Karit Mateku is the Awudo Messenia High School headmaster. So when I came in, we had about only 18 desktop functioning there that couldn't support effective teaching and learning of elective ICT. So the same year, we had quickly have to procure 20 additional desktop for us to have one lab that we used last year to write exams. But the interest of students to read elective ICT rose very high. So currently, we have over 270 students preparing to write 2023 was in a bid to contribute to the development of their alma mater the 1998 badge with support from the 2001 badge sponsored the establishment of an ultra modern lab for the school the president of the 1998 badge of the old student union of awudo messenia high school dr gertrude tovike said the badge would continue to support the development of the school we, we think that the ICT lab project is very important because we know the role of ICT in our daily lives. Now we cannot do anything without uh, a component of ICT. And with the current euphoria about AI and uh, digitalization, data science, we need to equip our students. And we think that one of the ways is to have a computer lab for them so that they can start trying their hands at it and get prepared for the world ahead. Our next move is to support the Oswa National to build the, the clinic project. It's a big clinic we are building for the school. This system will also support our virtual learning system. Because we are expecting that there will come a time our objective test will be written electronically. You only come in, sit down, read the question, answer the question, and then the system will mark it for you. So the computers coming in now will come to support our virtual learning project in the school. So in effect now we have three labs that we can use for ICT. But our original plan is, is must have five labs. So we still have two labs in deficit. Fred Kwamia, Joy News, Chito. Poetry in Ghana has gone through several stages. It has progressed from being scoffed at to becoming a standard in our culture. Writer and poet Apioko Seiram Ashong Abe revealed that the poetic space in Ghana had seen an immense growth with women playing a larger role. She was speaking at the Goethe Abansro on Wednesday. There's more in this report by Jacqueline Ansumayaboa. Poetry has mostly evolved into a kind of representation and a means of addressing societal issues through written and spoken words. Ghana's poetry scene is gradually expanding. Writer and poet Apioko Sairam Ashon Agbe asserted that more women have been given larger platforms as the poetry community has developed. Ah, it's grown a lot. For one thing, we have more women. Now we have an entire 
slam dedicated to female poets. That wasn't the case before. And now we're having events like this where we're on Joy News or on different platforms. I work with City Poetry is showing up. It wasn't so before. You have events where the first thing somebody thinks about is let's get a poet to open the you know the, the 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 event it wasn't like that before you only think of a musician at best a cultural troupe but it's changing and i also think that young people are now seeing poetry as a viable craft and a viable business opportunity within the creative art there's still a lot of work to do she also revealed that most Ghanaians mark themselves in order to deal with issues happening in the country you think that Ghanaians wake up every morning and wear a mask um, we keep it pushing, we tend to hide our feelings a lot, our emotions, we're a little more diplomatic about what we're really thinking when somebody offends us and whatnot. But even just dealing with some of the situations in the country, we wear masks and you know, we, we, we keep the fire burning regardless of what we're going through. Director of the Writers Project of Ghana, Dr. Martin Egble Wokbe indicated that the Gwerth Abansho Project is a platform that will help them engage deeply with poets and how best they can contribute to developments. So, um, a new kind of concept of uh, engaging with poets that uh, we as Writers Project of Ghana and the Gothi Institute have come up with. Um, it's uh, new but not too new, having uh, already gone through about one year. Um, but the whole idea actually is to create a platform where we can engage more deeply with poets. So not only do we listen to their poetry, we are able to ask what are the the ideas behind the poems are there other things that the poet might want to say beyond the lines that they've presented worth aban show is held on the first wednesday of every second month jacqueline answer your boys report for joy news what is your greatest fear well that's it for the news up next to the news review and we're joined by parliamentary aspirant for hohoi vera yaira haibo she is our guest do stay Well, a very good morning to you. Thank you for staying with us. It's time now for uh, the news review and introducing, yes, we announced it, and she's here, parliamentary aspirant for Hohoi, uh, on the ticket of the NDC, of course, Vera Yaira Haibo. She is our guest uh, this morning with us. Vera, a very good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Um, and it's good to have you on board. Just uh, curious, is, is this your first stint with us? Yes. On TV? Yes. Okay. Well, welcome aboard. Thank you. So we're going to get into the papers. Uh, of course, we know that this segment is brought to us by Endpoint Homeopathic uh, Clinic. And I'll tell you a bit about them. They're offering free prostate screening, free female fertility screening, and all roads lead to them. Now, here's where you can locate them. Here in Accra, they are at Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard. They're also in Kumasi, Kronomabwe, here behind the Angel Educational Complex. Then there's Takradi Anaji State, Tema Community 22. There's Techiman Hanswa and Esiama Enzima. Now, you can reach them on the following number, 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end. To chronic disease but just the start of the news review vera so i have with me the daily graphic and the business finder newspapers what do you have i have the daily statesman the daily guide and the Ghanaian times All right so let's make track uh, tracks with these papers and find out what they have to share with us uh, this morning uh, and uh, maybe before that before we get into the papers uh, you're a new face uh, for, <laughs> for most of us. Let's talk about that. I always get excited when I hear of women aspiring to go to parliament or to take part in any form of our uh, governance structure. So kudos to you for even making that attempt. Thank you. Tell us about your peculiar situation. Hohoi, 
Ahoye is a bit of a tricky seat, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Tell us about why you even want to go for that seat. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to contest, I don't know if you know the number of women in parliament in the first place. 20 or so. Is it 20%? 40. We have 40 women in parliament. But about 20%, right? Yeah. Not even up to about 13.5 because oh, we have 20. I, here, here's why I, it's 20 on each side. <laughs> exactly. 20 it was on the NDP side, planned. 20 on the MPP <laughs> exactly. side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've always found that a bit of a weird coincidence. <laughs> Quite weird. So right. um, that's one of the reasons because I believe we need more representation mm. because there's a lot of um, women in the country. When you look at the percentage between men and women, mm. we should have at least a bit of an equal... Of course, women have always been more than men. Exactly. Uh, but, the last few censuses. But when it comes to parliamentary representation, right. we have very few of them. So it means our views are not being represented. So that is one of the reasons why I decided so to join. Women's the issues coming to the fore. Exactly. That's part of why you're you're exactly. engaging in this endeavor. Okay. Exactly. What and else? I've always believed in social democracy, and that's the reason why I'm on the tickets of the NDC in the mm. first place. And then the hallway is a peculiar place. Um, as you know, it's the only seat in the Volta yeah. region yeah. that has been taken by the MPP. And I believe... That's John Peter Mill. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I am the right candidate to first take the seat from him and also transform the lives of the people. That's going to be a Herculean task. First, you have to cross the hurdle of beating the other contenders mm -hmm. in your own primary. Exactly. Uh, who are these other people contending with you? I know there are a lot of we men have five, in the pool. Five other people. Mm. Five other people. Mm. And um, there's one other woman. And I'm the Sith. So three men and four, four men, men and two women. Exactly. Mm. exactly. So that's uh, two men for every lady. <laughs> exactly. There. So exactly. even there, <laughs> there's some competitive edge for the men. But what makes you think, Vera, that you can make the cut, first of all, mm -hmm. to beat the other contenders, mm -hmm. including the other woman mm -hmm. on board, mm -hmm. and go ahead to beat John Peter Amewu. I want you to start from that small group before I get to what John Peter Amewu has done in Hohoi mm. and why you think you can, you know, unseat him. Okay, I've always, think, I've always thought that our body of politicking is mm. quite different, like... When people go about telling people what they can do for the constituency, they only touch on a few people, give them something like, uh, we have something like poster boys and girls, speak to them to influence the other people. They don't go about impacting lives. I think that the style I'm using now, okay, so I'm working on my skills. I'm giving um, the women, not just women, people in the community, I'm training them in different skills. Um, liquid soap making, powdered soap, antiseptic, and putting people into apprenticeship because mm. I believe that whatever someone wants to do in future, you should give a glimpse of how the future looks like. So I'm giving the constituents a glimpse of what I can do for them mm. when they assess me and they believe that, no, this is what we want. This is somebody we want in the constituency. We know she can develop the constituency. We know she can represent us fairly. Also because of my background, uh, I'm doing PhD in law. I'll be a doctor in December, God willing. Amen. And, <laughs> and so they know that I'm able to represent them fairly in parliament. And so with the kind of style I have chosen to um, go by, I believe uh, they can see the good intentions that I have, and then give me the note. Let me just ask you these questions, and then we'll, we'll cap off the conversation on your aspirations as far as Parliament is uh, concerned. And um, by the way, as a student of law myself, I am, it's good to know that you're pursuing it at that level. Yeah. More power to your elbow. Thank you. Now, if not for this contest, would you be doing these things that you were doing for the people, helping them in soap making? Oftentimes, the reality is mm -hmm. that when you see people doing these things, it is either they are knocking on the door of uh, trying to lead their communities in some way, or they have aspirations for the future. Very rarely would you see instances where people do this out of their, the generosity of their hearts. And then over time, the people rather come to them and say, you know what, you've done so much over the years, decades, why don't you represent us? 
That's one. Okay. Then two, all these things you're promising, you're giving them a glimpse of what you can do for them in the future. But Sam will tell you, our current member of parliament, and he's also done quite a number of these social in interventions, John Peter Meu, is already doing that. So what are you going to do differently? Okay. Those are questions I would like you uh, to address. So if not for this contest, would you be doing all of this? And, and maybe just tied to that, just tied to that. <laughs> it's on the same thread, just tied to that. Don't you think, even now that you're not a member of parliament, mm. you already, you, you seemingly are making promises. This is what I can do. Don't you think we should find a way of moving our, our parliamentary leadership process from the promises? Oftentimes, the things parliamentarians or aspirants promise are not even things that lie within their purview. What, what do you make of that? That's quite a number of questions. The so first, let's, let's the start first from, question. Let's start from why you're doing this. Yes, if I've not always been doing this. this You've is always not, been doing yes, this. Yes, yes, yes. I've been helping people out. It's just that I don't bring it to the media front. So it's not so you're as bringing if, it now because you I'm want coming to. into the limelight. Actually, the reason being that I was already doing it, then media outlets started calling me. They're like, oh, why not we interview you? Because what you are doing is quite different. We've not seen this kind of politicking, you know, before. Mm. So I already help our people. In fact, I had a friend who said, um, Vera, what would be your biggest challenge when you become, you know, a member of parliament? And I said, my biggest challenge is to tell the world what I'm doing for others. Because I've always been the type that when I help people, I don't, want, from the yes, I don't want I others to know. Mm. And so this was one of the challenges I had. And, um, but then when it came to the fact that now I'm going into a contest, it's now on a larger scale. Because I'm now having more resources to help our people. So you have to put your fact, best it, foot forward. Exactly. Huh? Actually, it's satisfying to see that I can actually help more people in this tangent. And two, these are not promises. I'm not promising. In fact, one of the reasons when I meet all the constituents, I told them, that I don't make promises. Whatever I can do, I'll tell you now and do it. I won't make future promises. I'll build this. No, 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 no. Mm. These are basic things that, in fact, everybody in the community should have access to. Right. And so they are not promises. They are developmental projects that I'm doing to impact lives. Mm. And then you did say that, um, why not we move away from the politics of, you know, promises and rather focus a, a on re things, representation. Those who are in parliament now promised and en route you know, uh, yeah. to getting into parliament were things that were out of their hands in the first place. We've, we've got to the point where politicians must promise, oh, roads and all of that. The parliamentarian doesn't. He's a legislator or she's a legislator. They make laws. They yes. can lobby, but they do not run these things to communities. Do you know why I'm asking you? Mm -mm. It's a dangerous trend. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I had two MPs, mm -hmm. Roxanne Nelson, Dafia Mekwa, mm -hmm. South Dying, mm -hmm. Professor Kingsley Nyako, Kwaraso, in the studio. Okay. A lot of these members of parliament are spending 20,000, 30,000, <laughs> 40,000 plus CDs, in, depending on how big your constituency is, depending yeah. on the requirements. Right. And that is also fostering, yeah. in a way, I feel, yeah. corruption, graft in the system. Yeah. They yeah. must get some resources from somewhere to meet those. You know where the challenge is? I don't know whether it's a chicken and egg situation. Which one came first? <laughs> <laughs> because, you see, our mm. MCs, we don't vote for our MCs. Mm. The people vote for their MPs and they feel the MPs, actually, we are accountable to the people. Mm. There is the major duty of the MP to represent the people, but there's also the oversight duty to bring development to the people. Right. And because they vote for us, or the people vote for the MPs, they know that they can always hold the MPs to account. But the MCs, we don't vote for them. And so they are not able to, you know, be, but in actual fact, the MCs are the developmental agents in any constituency. Mm. So if we Ghanaians would agree to vote for our MCs, I think this particular issue would be resolved. But this administration tried something in that respect at a point, and the president himself, you know, pulled that back. But that was also because there was no support from, from your party's end. So you feel that moving into the future, we should get to the point where DCEs, MCEs, 
are voted for. There was a reason on political were... lines. On political lines. So because NDC even and the DP. yes, even people the assembly. That would just be another no. uh, trans. I mean, <laughs> you would just transmogrify what is happening in parliament to the grassroots and even destroy. The I don't system believe further. so. Even the assembly elections that we say is devoid of political ties, we all know. It's just that we, we are all pretending, but we all know that political parties sponsor assemblymen. You go to constituencies where it is MPP dominated, all the assemblymen are, you know, sympathetic towards the MPP and vice versa. Right. Interesting, interesting, interesting points you have made. Uh, and uh, we wish you the very best, but should you get to parliament? When I have these conversations, I always smile in my head because, and sometimes I tell uh, the representatives of the people here that, Asema Uke, Kaniyo, because Udruwa, <laughs> some of us will remember and of will course. hold you to what you've said. Sure. But very interesting uh, points you have made on this. Mm -hmm. And I do agree that maybe, maybe, just maybe we should uh, get leadership at the grassroots elected, like mm -hmm. in other jurisdictions in the United States, in exactly. the UK, they have them. So mm -hmm. development can start from there. True. Parliamentarians are not meant for a lot of the things we see them. Mm -hmm doing or attempting to do all right but let's get into the papers now the daily graphic this morning ensuring peace for accelerated development our concern that's according to president Okufuado. more women unemployed than men that's according to the ghana statistical service i'll give you a take on that <laughs> media must cease uh, excessive politicization gja on press freedom day gifty afenidazi former president of the gja was speaking at the world press Freedom Day. Interesting developments. Um, but the excessive politicization uh, isn't it the politicians themselves who have taken over media entities and have created that tailspin mm. of politicization. There's also MMDC is an acting capacity lawful. Supreme Court dismisses Dafia Metbo's uh, suit, of course, that has to do with Roxton. Yeah. And uh, there was a story there. So let's, let's quickly do these. <clears throat> We'll start with uh, the banner headline. So media outlets have been cautioned to guard against excessive politicization to consolidate the country's democratic gains. This was expressed by a former president of the GJA, Mrs. Gifty Afenidazi, and the current president, Albert Kwabena, Kwabena Jumfo, in separate remarks as Ghana marks the 2023 World Press Freedom Day in Accra yesterday. World Press Freedom Day was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly in 1993, following a recommendation adopted by the 26th session of the UNESCO General Conference in 1991. So uh, my quick thought on that, yes, the media must cease excessive politicization for those entities that are engaging in them. But I say, when you have a proliferation of media outlets that are tagged to political parties, both the newspapers, the mm -hmm. print media, mm -hmm. and radio, and television, even on social media. And they are clearly NBC or MPP. Sometimes, look, you pick a newspaper <laughs> and you know the trajectory. One story. You can read a number of newspapers and depending on where those newspapers stand, you can see the slant clearly. Right. Pro-government against the government. It is not news. It is, it is propaganda. <laughs> no, let's, let's call it spade a spade. That is what we've been doing. And that is what we ought to tackle. Immediately, political elements started getting into owning media houses, houses. and all of that. You're this right. was bound to happen. Right. So let's not be hypocritical mm -hmm. and I'm bury pretending. our heads in the sand. Yeah. We know what the problem is. And some of these people who speak as well, and I'm not going to mention any names, some of them, they themselves, are tainted with politics. Yeah. So sometimes when certain comments are passed, it's, you cannot help but take it with a grain of salt. Yes. I mean, he who pays the... Piper. ...calls the, the tune. tune. So where are the media houses getting their fundings from? Good question. Who pays them? Some and of so, them. Yeah. Because there are established media houses. I don't want to tout where I am, but we all know the trajectory, the history. Yeah. versus those that just sprung up from whatever the source of money is <laughs> and are doing this. So we know the issues. Let's get to them. But, but the other issue, Ghana has been taking a dent, a beating, as far as our press freedom ratings yes, are concerned. concerned over the years. That is another thing we ought to be looking at as a country because in one breath, we say 
the press is free. In mm -hmm. fact, I found it egregious mm -hmm. when Mr. President, at the State of the Nation address earlier this year, yeah. suggested that there was so much freedom of speech that members of the diplomatic corps, I think that was, that was a gaffe. <laughs> His handlers are there, I think. That was a serious gap. I have engaged some diplomats behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And what they told me, even, mm. suggests that it was a very unfortunate statement. statement but anyway, President. that was Mr. President's choice. Um, to say that even it's become so free that diplomats can air their views. But let's follow the trajectory. John Benjamin aired his views in the previous administration. He was scathing. Yeah, yeah. Scathing. Mm -hmm. The likes of John Dumelo know, know <laughs> very well. We've had a number of... I don't want to go into it, I but, mean, it's quite but I think it's, it's very problematic. It's, yes, because first, if we don't recognize that there is a problem, if the, uh, the president himself that does not recognize that there's a problem, then there'll be no solution. Do you think it. there's a problem? Yeah, if we, we have dropped... Speech. Yes, we dropped from 60 to... Is it 62? 60 second? Yeah. It means in fact, there's been a consistent drop in the, drop. In the yes. Mm. So there is definitely a problem. But if the one who is leading the country doesn't even see the problem, then there will be no solution to it. There are Which allusions to what happened to Ahmed Hussein Suali, for example. So date we and now we're finding out that in fact there is no process, no. so to speak, yeah. technically mm -hmm. ongoing as far as his death is it's concerned. concerned. And and that that gives a lot of cause for worry. Exactly. I've always said, Ghana, when I'm staying here, because yes, of course. This is, my, this is where my bread is buttered. Mm -hmm. This is where I operate. This is where I find, you know, some sort of, that raison d'etre, as the French would put it. Mm -hmm. But if this space becomes unsafe for me, yeah. what does that mean? Someone was killed, cold-blooded murder. And, and I'll tell you days. this. In times past, mm -hmm. I have been a morning show host over the last eight plus, almost nine years. Oh, wow. Less. It was on radio before. Okay. Now I'm on TV. TV. In times past, no one would ask me, oh, do you feel safe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you this or that? Mm -hmm. But today, I have my priest at church. I have my mother. Mm. I have people close to me asking, do you feel safe? Do they send you messages? Are you getting threatened? And, and the reality is, yes, oh. I do get threatened. Okay. Okay. Sometimes it is subtle. Sometimes it is barefaced. But mm. yes, I do. And if anyone wants to come to me and ask for text messages or show. stuff, some of them you just, you know, or calls. And, and sometimes it's... Do you it's, feel it's safe very... saying this, though? Oh, well, uh, he, you probably don't know me very well. I have something called blunt thoughts. I, I really... I don't want to say I don't care two hoots, okay. but I am the type who would say it as it is mm -hmm. and honestly damn the consequences. Okay. Uh, and I think we need, we need more a lot more those. people like that. Because the number of people who reach out to me every week... I'll be checking up on you this day. Are you okay? <laughs> Is, so let's put all of that into perspective. But having said that, let's also not denigrate. Let's also not forget that we've come very far. You're right. And that the press freedom we enjoy... It's something we ought to hold on to. It is not as though the situation were horrible, mm. as though nothing were in place. There are some good things to talk about as well. So let's balance the act. But we're only saying that we can do better. better. That's, that's the whole You're point. Right. Now, more women unemployed than men, statistical service. I'll just wrap on that so you can do the stack of papers you have. I'm bringing that up because, of course, I know you're passionate about <laughs> women's issues. So two out of every three of unemployed individuals are females, a survey by the Ghana Statistical Service has revealed. Also, one in every four youth are neither in training in school nor employed, pushing the rate of youth unemployment up from 19.7% to 25%. Worrying statistics. Now, the survey on the Ghana 2022 Annual Household Income and Expenditure Third Quarter Labor Force Report said in all, over 1.7 million Ghanaians representing 13.2% of the labor force were unemployed, with some unable to find jobs, unable to find food to eat, mm. and were multi-dimensionally Poor. I think last year there was a report that showed that, especially on the back of COVID, mm -hmm. more people have had slipped Slept. into poverty. So yeah. this, for me, is rather worrying, both for men and women, but especially for women, yes. it's, it's a precarious situation. I mean, two Reactions? out of three. Yes. That, that is almost the whole female, that's more than half of the female population, the youth. 
And um, I've heard calls of, you know, governments making people go into entrepreneurship. But the question is, has the environment been created for people to embark on entrepreneurial, you know, gains? Most people do not even have meals to eat, not to talk of the capital, yeah. you know, to start a business. Yeah. And to tell you the truth, the Ghanaian youth are hardworking. Whatever they want, they want to find their hands on, they want to work. They are looking for work. In fact, in my constituency, we have most of the youth now going into, you know, agriculture. Because there's no work, you know, anywhere for them to do. And that is how come the skills training program I introduced in the constituency, they are embracing it. If you see the very young women, I think SS students, because of the, you know, the red, yellow, green system, you find some of them staying at home for three months. They come around just to learn the skills, start something to earn money. And so I will encourage the government to create that environment. If they are saying, I think a cap has been laid on employment in the, you know, public yeah, sector. Sort of moratorium. Exactly. And the private sector that has to employ to most of them are no longer employing because of the economic crisis, you know, in the country. And so if you are saying this would let the youth or force the youth, okay, to go into entrepreneurship, what arrangements have we done? Yeah. What preparations have we done towards the youth? I mean, a lot of the youths have ideas, brilliant ideas, but they do not have the capital, you know, to start. I always find it shocking when people say the youth are lazy. No. I've heard that a number of times. I mean, there every I every disagree with in that every statement. group you would have some people who are this or that. Yes, if you be a mensa woman. Ah, but yeah. but I disagree. Yeah. I know a lot of young people. How many friends do I have? People who are even my seniors mm -hmm. from university in my uh, undergrad days who had first class, second upper, hard working and wanting to, <laughs> a lot of them, you know, there's unemployment and there's underemployment well, where you are not able to use your skill set. Let's say an architect and he's doing something totally he's working in the bank. or different. <laughs> All of that is in there. I, yeah. A lot of people I know who were excelled in mathematics and other things whom we could have used to develop our country. Some of them are doing, I don't want to say something so someone will say I'm denigrating their work but they are doing things that are, are nowhere in so their scope or bearing and now they are finding their way out of the country mm. most of them want to leave you know immigrate elsewhere where their skills can be appreciated I mean not just Ghana the, the whole masses. of Africa has a very young population a, a very young population that even the West are jealous of, mm. but we are not able to utilize. I always say that the day Africa will recognize that human resource is their biggest natural resource, that will be the day we will break economic crisis. We will break the economic tie. Because I believe that the human resource, look at Cuba. Mm. They don't have any natural resources. They invest in their doctors. Very little. And then export it, you know, export it all over. Why can't we in, uh, invest in our own youth? And then... Good, good, good calls. Very good calls. Uh, there's also this one here, just for your reaction. NDC flag bearership. I'm right leader at right time, Dr. Dufour. What do you think, going into May the 13th, uh, that, that race... Some have already called the race. Some say it's just a waste of time. But what do you think of Dr. Kwabena Dufour? Before you get into uh, your... Um, I, I believe that we are in a democracy and that everybody should be given the opportunity to... Fair hearing. Uh, yeah, fair hearing. And so it's... Party. I mean, <laughs> once <laughs> he's in the race, whoever gets, you know, elected knows that he didn't have... It's easy. You know, I believe that if I'm in a competition and I go on a post, it wouldn't be satisfying. Right. But when I go with other aspirants and I emerge the winner, if you realize the campaign has now changed, you know, because there's competition. Mm. Um, JM is going around the whole country, you know, engaging with delegates and all that. For instance, if he was going alone, I, I'm not sure he would, you know, interact a lot with delegates like right. he's doing. So, so you feel it's good for them? It's, a, it's good. Right. It's good. Let's get into uh, your stack of papers. In fact, I'll have you complete your stack before I come back in.
So where are you starting from? The Daily Statesman? The Daily Statesman. It okay. says, focus on economic rights, information minister urges media. That's quite interesting Ties that we in. have in yeah. <laughs> page two. Um, what is he actually saying? Okay, so he has commended the Ghanaian media for their indispensable role in social economic development in the country, but he believes that um, there should be an increased focus on uh, economic rights. Um, I don't know what you think about this, but I think the media has really been speaking a lot mm. about the economic you know, situation yeah. in the country and how... Recently, there was that Cordeo bit. And exactly. Others came in. The, the fact, and me, like I said, I say it bluntly, mm -hmm. especially in media, uh, I think I saw a post by, by someone some time back talking about the fact that a hungry uh, journalist, <laughs> journalist is... will not give off the best. Journalism, right. is it comes with a certain integrity. And some of us have taken pain mm. to try to toe the middle line, to not allow any influence. And that is why, interestingly, in the Mahama administration, when we're going hard on certain issues, we're attacked. Okay. Under this administration, when you're going... we're going hard on issues, and You've now been we're attacked. attacked. It, it at least paints a picture that we found that middle ground. You're right. But when most of the journalists are ill-paid in the country, yeah. and it's not something we can hide from, yeah. it is a reality. You're right. Go to most of the media outlets, especially these ones springing up and all of that, and ask people how much they are earning. It's, it's a pittance. Mm. How do you expect that person to keep body and soul together, put clothes on his back or her back, and still do the job with integrity? Mm. Those are the problems. Mm -hmm. So, so how do we resolve those issues? I mean... Well, <clears throat> resolving it will take quite a number of factors. Uh, some have said, for example, that there should be a professional you know, entity for journalists in terms of the practice of journalism so that okay. you don't just get to call yourself a journalist mm -hmm. simply because maybe you're on radio or TV yeah. without certain requirements. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could be a starting point. So that there are some qualifications and coming with the qualifications. For example, a chartered accountant. Mm. There are certain minimum fees you so would you pay, pay yeah. a chartered accountant, right. for example. Right. Do you get it? Yes. So if you qualify, then look, the starting grade or starting point is this. If you can't meet that, it means you can't recruit the person. Maybe these are some of the, the, the options. But we I have another question. Looking at the, where the background of the information minister, were you expecting him to touch on this on you know, the world's day of <clears throat> media, or you expected him to touch on other worrying issues like, you know, the media, we dropping in the media space from, mm. you know, 60 to 62. 62. Well, he addressed pertinent issues. I wouldn't take that away from him, okay. uh, Kojo. But uh, yes, and, and I'm not surprised because usually it doesn't speak well for us. Okay. So those are things that government operatives would Avoid. Okay. I, I don't find that surprising. And I wouldn't hold that against him, okay. really. I right. wouldn't. Okay. Um, National, <clears throat> National Cathedral deflates bombshell claims. Mm. You know the story of uh, uh, Honorable Okujeto Ablapa. He's been right. digging deeper and deeper into the... I don't know whether to call it a scandal, the National Cathedral scandal. And uh, it's on the page two. And it says the National Cathedral Secretariat has described as unfortunate the pertinence of the MP for North Town, Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, over the construction of the cathedral project. I think recently he was in the US to you know find out about some other issues that were happening there. He said there was another trustee board. That did not include any of the uh, trustees that we had in Ghana. Mm. And the National Cathedral um, Secretariat is saying that that other, branch, that other board is not a branch, you know, to the one here. I don't know your thoughts on that, <laughs> um, on that issue. They are saying they are separate entities. One yeah. was set up to raise funds in the U.S., for you know, this, this National Cathedral thing, the entirety of it, I, I mean, I am not so 
<laughs> yes, all of these are pertinent issues, but I, I have set time without number. I have <clears throat> never had in my views. That's one thing about me. If you know me, you know what my take is on major matters. The National Cathedral, I am very Christian, very Catholic. And oh. those who know me will know that I am a staunch practitioner. But at the same time, I feel that if the people are going through what we're going through now, Come on, it is not the time for us to do this. Again, <laughs> it's taken quite a, a, a length of time. Yeah. For example, the Notre Dame was put together over centuries. Yeah. Most of these, in fact, even the one in, is it Washington, mm. D.C.? The room was not built it, in a day. It wasn't built in a day. Yeah. I feel if we had made this more national in scope rather than partisan, partisan. Yeah. we could have said, okay, let's do this. It's a futuristic project. Yes. At least we've done this. And bit by bit, we'll put it up. Mm -hmm. And there could have been some consensus, yeah. some agreement that as a people, okay, let's do this. Yeah. I feel that is the very root of the problem this project is facing. I totally agree. And recently, I've heard some stalwarts. I've, I've just forgotten whom, but many people have said this thing. First of all, my problems. It's ballooned from about $100 million to, to over $400 million. Exactly. That is, is already problematic, yeah. especially in our economic mm -hmm, situation. Mm -hmm. I have my problems with whether that project will be completed before the end of 2024. I doubt. Because when that happens, it just becomes another elephantine project. You don't complete it if a different administration, even if, if the comes. MPP is retained, mm -hmm. someone else may say, that is I not my, think. I don't want to continue with it. Then what happens to taxes, Thousand. the people's money that has been invested in this? Because yeah. mind you, we're told it wouldn't be taxpayers' money. Exactly. But now we are seeing... Taxpayers' money, money being So used. those are my concerns yeah. with, with the project. I think the project needs to be... Anyway, with the IMF requirements, I doubt they'll be able to continue with this because well, these are the, some of the social projects we've been asked to you know, mm. cut on. So Let's quickly look at some other them. stories. Okay. The Daily Guide is also uh, there. The Daily Guide. Mm. Um, it's official. <laughs> Baumia joins MPP race. Um, amend laws against journalists. I think you'll be interested in, in this one. <laughs> I um, definitely will. Parliament considers CJ nominee. And then um, Joe Gatti storms a half region for votes. Another man kills lava. I don't know which one you would want to delve into, but... Um, you maybe, choose. Um, Parliament considers CJ nominee because um, it's a female I'm seeing here. So I'm excited already, <laughs> and her name is Justice Gertrude, Gertrude. Araba Isaba Saki. Toko, I don't know, Tokonu. is it Tokonu? Yeah. Okay, Tokonu, page three of the... Of and we've been talking video. about this for a number of days now, the yeah. third in some, what, is it 17 years? Yes, third in 17 years. Georgina Wood. Uh, Sophia Kufu, and, and, and now here. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, I would say it's a great... Um, Achievement for the women. Definitely. Yes, and uh, I think we'll go on to the next. Um, Express opinion on... So that's the Ghanaian Times you are at now? Yes, the Ghanaian, the Ghanaian Times. Times newspaper. Express opinion on matters fearlessly. Just I think the media has taken over the today's headlines. Yeah. <laughs> Express opinion on matters fearlessly. Justice AJ charges journalists. Mm. And I'm sure you have taken that charge already. Uh, more than 900 Ghanaians die from prostate, prostate cancer annually. Mm. That's worrying. Very. That's worrying. And that's why we've been talking about endpoint homeopathic clinic. Mm. I'll be telling okay. uh, our audience or our viewers more about that at the tail end. But I, I do my check every year. Oh, yes. congratulations. I've not done it yet this year, I confess. I usually do it around my birthday, so I'm about... A month plus late. Okay. Mm. Okay. Then you should encourage other men to do that. Oh, yes. I definitely do. Okay. I do it on the show consistently. Good. Mm. That's good. But 900 Ghanaians, no, that's annually, that's too much. Um, I think we have the same story from the Daily Graphic here. Mm. Government celebrates media, urges greater focus on economic rights. Um, Mr. Koju upon Nkrumah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll touch a bit on the page 12 again. Though we've... So, owing to time, I think that'll be our final story. Oh, okay. And we can wrap. Okay. Oh, have you touched on this? Let's do I'll, I'll just read business. the headlines so okay. you can do that story. Okay. Um, express opinion on matters fearlessly. Justice, AJ charges journalists. Um, he says that um, 
indicated that journalists have an obligation to fearlessly express their opinion on matters that promote development in the country. According to him, situations where media practitioners who expose wrongdoings of some members of the public are intimidated by politicians must be condemned at all levels. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with him on this. Right. Yeah. Well, interesting. Uh, that brings to mind Professor uh, Kwabna Frimpong mm -hmm. uh, Boating and uh, some of what has happened in recent times. Well, a very good morning uh, to Prof, if you're watching us this morning. The business finder Ghana bags $3.5 billion from non-traditional exports in 2022. Ecobank launches double salary promo reloaded and Newmont Africa's reliable, Newmont Africa's reliable development pa partner. All of those stories in the business finder newspaper. Vera, yeah, it's, been, it's been good having you join the conversation this morning what are your parting words as you take leave of us um i want to say that you should look out or watch out for me mm. in the political space because i'm coming in with a new force with when you new said you were ideals, coming I, yes. I almost thought you were going to say you were coming like a guy <laughs> okay you know i had already made a statement that i'm the church of fly that will bring down the elephant oh okay. yes so you should look out for the honorable church of fly when the time comes but i i believe i'll bring in a new you know um era into our political space right. and i'm urging everyone to support me and push me so we can have at least one plus more woman in parliament that is if the other women are retained. That's, that's another... Oh, uh, yes. Thing. That's quite interesting. So, Vera uh, Yaira Haibo is contesting. She is a parliamentary aspirant for Hohe. So, we have a political mosquito, and now we have a political sexy fly. All of them <laughs> in the NDC. But that's how we cap off uh, the news review. Don't you forget, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, all roads lead there. They are offering... Free prostate screening, free female fertility screening. You can locate them here in Accra at Spintex opposite the Shell signboard in Kumasi Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. Takwadi Anaji State Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa and Esiama in Zima. Call them on 0244-867068 or 0274-234-321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic the end to chronic disease. But right now, let's serve you sports. There's been so much happening, you don't want to miss a beat on the local scene, on the international scene. Sports up next. Stay. Good morning, it's time for sports on the AM show. My name is Haruna Mubarak. Now, the Black Princess's head coach, Yusuf Bazigi, says his target is to win the maiden edition of the Waffle Zombie U20 Women's Cup of Nations. Ghana will host the competition, which kickstarts on May 20 and have been paired in Group A with Benin and Ivory Coast. You want to perform. Even if Ghanaians are not expecting, you should put pressure on I enjoy working under pressure. So for me, um, I think that that is even very good. Because one, we will think of not disappointing Ghanaians, we think of even country expectations. So that's why initially I said, I have set target for myself. Even without FA telling me, this is your target. I have already set the target since we were tasked to uh, host the, the tournament. So that I'll work by that. And that is what is going to edge me on to work very hard. So for that one, yes, uh, pressure is part of the game. However, uh, that pressure will not overcome what I'm supposed to do. I'll use it as a guide to work towards achieving our uh, target. This time round, I'll say that all the countries are doing well. You can't underrate or underestimate any country. So. Uh, in as much as we all know Ghanaians, we have the talent, there's more to it than that. For me, I don't look at it from that angle. I look at it from players with character, players with insight, so that 
with them you can achieve. But if you look at their some, their, excuse me to say, they are training horses. You see them at training, they are perfect. You use them at tension matches or crucial matches, they will disappoint you. So for me, I am looking at it from that angle. That is where you can get the best out of the best. So I think that uh, that is how we are going to structure our team. Players with character, with insight. We look at their insight and we look at the character that they have in them. Mental fortitude. Because you need to withstand every pressure that is coming on you. Because when they come here, we are also going to put pressure on them because we need the results. We are not going to relax at all. So. From women's football to men's football, and Mohamed Kudus has been recognized as one of the best young dribblers playing in the top 35 leagues in the world. Now, Kudus, who is presently having his best season with Ajax, has demonstrated not only his ability to score goals, but also to take on opponents with his speed and dribbling ability. CIES Football Observatory has classified the Black Stars midfielder as the fourth best U23 dribbler following Real Madrid's Vinicius Jr., Santos and Angelo Gabriel, and Bayern Munich's Jamal Musiala. Kudus is also ranked higher than Real Madrid's forward Rodrigo, who is ranked fifth. Meanwhile, the former Ajax man is having the most successful dribbling rate, outperforming Vinicius Jr., Bukayo Saka, and Jamal Musiala, with a 76.9 success rate. To the English Premier League and NL Haaland broke the record for most goals this in a single season as Manchester City returned to the top of the table as they beat West Ham 3-0. Now Liverpool also beat West Ham. Well, City beat um, their opponents. It was Liverpool rather who beat West Ham by one goal to nil to boost their hopes of finishing in the top four. Hopeful and tonight Manchester United Brighton as the Red Devils fight for Champions League football next season. Here's their head coach. Eric Ten Hag. To, to the Serie A, Inter Milan smashed Lecce 6-0 to maintain their top four spot, while cross-town rivals AC Milan and Roma could only secure draws. These are highlights for you from last night's action. Three. That's your sports here on the AM show. My name is Haruna Mubarak. Welcome back on the AM show. And as we kickstart our big stories, we focus on the public interest and accountability report for 2022. Now, it shows that for two consecutive years, 2021 and 2022, 1.74% and 2.39%, that was what the Ministry of Finance was not able to meet in terms of the requirement of transferring 5% of the APFA to the District Assembly Common Fund. PIAC also reiterates that governments should direct disbursements to the GIIF intended for Agenda 111 to the Ministry of Health under the health component of the education and health priority area to support the Agenda 111 project. Additionally, that same uh, funding, GIIF, should focus the utilization of its share of APFA on its core mandate of investing funds in commercial infrastructural projects in accordance with the GIIF Act and policy guidelines of the fund. Well, today, we're discussing these and more with our guest. He is Vice Chairman of PIAC. I'm talking about none other than Nasir Alpha Mohammed. A very good morning to you, sir. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thanks for coming. So we're just talking about how many times you have been on the show <laughs> uh, with me. For me, this is my second yeah, time. Yeah. But for you, this is your third time on uh, this platform. I'd just like to start from this latest report and what it evinces. Uh, we've had a number of reports in recent times showing different things, but as far as this specific PIAC report is concerned, in summary, what, what are the major takeaways as far as you're concerned? 
Um, thank you once more, and good morning to our viewers. Um, for me, I think PIAC is continually doing its uh, work as mandated by law. And for those who have been following the work of PIAC, its establishment, and what it has been doing for the last 11 years, uh, PIAC is mandated to do three things. The first is to be able to uh, do compliance monitoring of what is required of duty bearers under the law. The second is to give a platform for the people of Ghana to debate the propriety of how uh, petroleum revenues are being utilized. And then our final uh, mandate is for us to do independent assessment for each year um, of how petroleum revenues have been utilized. And for each year, we are talking about two statutory reports. The first is a semi-annual report, and the second an annual report. For the year 2022, we have published both reports. We published the 2022 annual report in September, uh, the 2022 semi-annual report in September 2022, and then the annual report was published this year, 2023, in March 20, uh, April 2023, as required by the law. And so, essentially, what I would say is that we have followed the due process of the law, but we, are, we have discovered also that there have been um, a number of interesting observations, some of which you have just indicated. Mm -hmm. The fact that even though um, the, the highest court of this land, that is the Supreme Court of Ghana, has pronounced that 5% of the annual budget funding amount each year should go to the District Assembly's Common Fund. This has not been fully complied with in the last two years. We say so because instead of the 5% that should go to the District Assembly's Common Fund, less than that amount for each of those two years has gone to the District Assembly's Common Fund. For us, this is a violation that, for whatever reason, we do not know why it happened. But we are praying that going forward, this doesn't repeat itself. You say so, this yeah. is a violation that, for whatever reason, shouldn't have happened. The law is the law. I believe the last time we had a conversation here, we spoke about some of these self-same issues. It appears yeah. we are not making any progress in that regard. Because the law is what it is, yet somehow we are always skirting the issues, circumventing the law, and what ought to happen doesn't happen. It also hampers our developmental progress as a country. So, I mean, really, in that respect, a certain percentage should be going to the District Assembly Common Fund, 5%. Yes. yes. For how long has, it, ha has this happened? Where, I well, mean, we're talking about 2021 and 2022, yeah, but I think, previously. I think it is important to establish the facts as they are. Mm. The Petroleum Revenue Management um, Act mm. itself did not make a provision for any percentage of money to be sent to the District Assembly's Common Fund. Mm. It took the Honorable Kodo, for those who know the Honorable yeah. Kodo, yes. Right. It took the Honorable Kodo and another member uh, to sue the, uh, the Republic, advocating that petroleum funds generally mm. should form part of the total revenues of Ghana for purposes of calculating the 5% uh, you know, revenue that should go to the District Assembly's Common Fund for distribution to the various municipal and district assemblies, mm. metropolitan municipal and district assemblies. Now, the Supreme Court did the analysis of the submissions made by the Honorable Kodo and Co. and came to the conclusion that it is not all the funds established under the Petroleum Revenue Management Act that applies to what they are, uh, they are advocating. But they agreed with the Honorable Kodo and, and his uh, other uh, colleague that only the annual budget funding amount Mm -hmm. Out of all the other, you know, uh, disbursements that we may have in the uh, Petroleum Revenue Management Act, it is only that annual budget funding amount to which, you know, should be applied uh, or which should be applied or considered in, in determining the 5% the revenue that should go to the um, District Assembly's Common Fund. And so when the Supreme Court says this is the law, Pierre considered that it should be followed in due process. And this happened in 2019. So the expectation was that from 2020, 2021, 2022, I mean, uh, they should be sending this 5% to the, the State Assembly's Common Fund. Now, in 2020, we did not actually see disbursements 
to the Administrative Assembly's Common Fund. Mm. But PIAC advocated strongly that it should not happen. And so in 2021, effectively, the disbursement to the District Assembly's Common Fund started. But as you have already indicated, instead of 5%, only 1.74% of what is due the District Assembly's Common Fund was sent in 2021. Mm. Then in 2022, instead of the 5%, only 2.3%. So it was better than the previous of that, year. Of course. So maybe there is a progressive uh, improvement in terms of what percentage is being disbursed to the District Assembly's Common Fund. So essentially, this is where we are coming from, just in less than three years. So hopefully because the whole thing started in 2019, and once the law comes into effect, uh, it means that from the 2020 uh, fiscal year, government ought to have started disbursing the 5% to the District Assembly's Common Fund. But we started uh, getting information about the disbursement in 2021. And we expected the whole, I mean, the full 5% to have gone to the District Assembly's Common Fund. That didn't happen. What happened was, like I indicated, less than, significantly less than that amount. So for the two consecutive years, that was what happened in terms of the District Assembly's Common Fund. Now, uh, even as we talk about the District Assembly's Common Fund, what, per your report, I'm sure you also... Uh, find the trajectory of what the absence of this is causing to the districts, for example, uh, in terms of what mm. they can do, uh, the provisions that must be made in the districts, the yeah. infrastructure yeah. that must be put in place. For some, it may be police, you know, security posts and all of that. What, what has been the cost uh, of not having these funds available to the districts, per the report? It's a huge cost. It's a huge cost because... We do um, district monitoring, we do regional monitoring of projects being funded with oil money, and it is simply appalling. There are some projects that are standing, uh, you know, uh, for more than a decade now, mm. supposedly being funded partly with oil money, but they are not yet complete. Because and these this, are, this, it's realistically in, is it 2010? Yes. That we, we, we yes. started with. But at least uh, between 2011, when we started receiving revenues, mm. and 2019, we cannot really put the blame on this particular amount. Mm. But the blame could go to essentially disbursing the annual budget funding amount equitably across the nation. However, between 2019 and 2022, as we said now, or 2023, we could attribute the lack of disbursement of the full percentage required by law to these district assemblies. We could actually advocate that, yes, it is causing a lot of problems. So, for example, we just returned from our regional engagements where we visited certain districts. I led the team to the Upper West region. The chairman of PIAC led another team of PIAC to the Bono region. Now, in the Upper West region where I led the team to, we observed a number of things which were really not, uh, you know, okay for us. So we have a health center um, at Egu, which is a community in the uh, Wild West uh, district of the Upper West region. Mm. Now, this health center is supposed to serve over 24 other communities surrounding the, that particular health center. Mm. Yet, we have only one ward which admits both males and, and females. females, right? So if, if your wife is sick, she's there. If I am sick, I'm not the husband, I'm likely to be admitted in the same ward where, you know, and we know what can happen uh, at the various hospitals. Sometimes you, are, you have to be helped to remove your share, do other things and all of that. Mm. And this is the kind of condition we are talking about. Some oil money is going into that project since 2020 and 2021. I mean, but the project had been awarded in 2011, 2012. So you ask yourself, between 2011, 2012, up till now, that is typically a decade. This project has not yet been completed. This will lead to cost overruns and then time overruns. Of course, first, let me say time overruns, time overruns, which will then lead to cost overruns in the long run. And so, and we have a big uh, issue with that. Then we're talking about building dams or small dug outs in the various communities. Mm. Then we visited a community like Yibile and then uh, uh, you know, uh, an adjacent community 
where two dugouts were made. And these were dugouts or small dams that were done supposedly to aid the indigenous to be able to farm during dry season. And it is not serving the purpose for which you know, uh, those uh, dugouts were made. We, are, we were told by the indigenous, indigenous that during dry season, the whole place is even dry. It is only because when we went there, there was some water there because it had rained uh, heavily in the past few days, and so there was some water. But the way embankment was constructed is, was such that on the other side of the embankment, that is where the people actually farm. But on the side where we have the, uh, you know, the dam, we don't have any farmlands around that place. Why was that? Yeah, you see, the idea is that at the point where you are designing the project, you ought to have included, uh, including canals that you know, could pass the water from the dam itself to where the people are farming. That has not been done. Mm. So what it means is that if they really want to use the water, you have to use a bucket manually, uh, cross over from your farm to the dam, fetch water, and then cross over again to be able to, and that's it's hectic. Tedious. Very tedious. That's not uh, serving their purpose, and they were complaining when we got there because we interviewed some of the indigenous. And that for us is not a prudent way of applying oil revenue. Mm. So for the Upper West region, we were hugely disappointed in terms of these two uh, projects in particular. And that cuts across the whole country. We have been to other uh, uh, districts in the past where we have been told that they were actually looking at investment in the agriculture um, uh, industry more than what they are seeing. And so the, it begs the question whether the indigenous were even consulted at all in terms of what are their priorities and what we are pushing the oil money into in those communities. So yes, uh, we can say that there is a, a cost to this whole thing, uh, especially at the uh, district assemblies, uh, the sub-national uh, uh, you know, areas in this country. When we look at some of your key findings or observations, one thing that hit me was the fact that over the last few years, uh, crude oil production had been declining in Ghana. But interestingly, on the back of the same dynamics we've uh, woefully cried about, COVID-19 and in fact the Russo-Ukrainian war, in 2022, our oil revenue was the highest we've ever seen, $1.43 billion. Yes. How do you put these together? Because in one breath you would say, oh, it's been declining. So maybe that is why even what is going through the APFA to the District Assembly's Common Fund has been handicapped or hobbled. But in another breath, we've actually got more than we've ever had from oil revenue just last year. Yeah. What, what sense did you make of the disparities we are seeing in the system versus these st statistics, so to speak? Actually, I wouldn't say it's a disparity for those who understand how the oil industry works. Mm -hmm. Petroleum pricing, the petroleum sector itself is very volatile. Right. Oil prices are very volatile. And then they play to the demands of the market and all that. So, and essentially, when we are doing our projected revenues, uh, we, we, we also consider the projected pro production that we are likely to get. Now, in 2022, the minister pegged the benchmark revenue at around 65 or 66 thereabout uh, per barrel. And in the course of the year, we all saw that oil prices catapulted to over $100 uh, per barrel. And so that essentially, even though we had a, a decline in, in, in production, the fact that we have a very high uh, oil price per barrel in the course of the year also enabled us to get more revenues at the end of the day mm. in a single year than in any other uh, year that... Uh, of course, the reality yeah. is that while we gained so much, we also lost so much. Yes. In terms of production, market. in terms of production, we lost. So by assuming we had succeeded in producing so much, we would have even gotten, uh, would have even gotten more than we have gotten now in terms of revenues. That is what it just simply means. Mm. But it is essential for us not to confuse the fact that because we have, uh, uh, let's say, declining uh, production, essentially we will have declining revenues. The dynamics can change. Where oil prices in the world market has actually increased that high. 
So you may have declining production, but you may actually have a uh, higher price. A higher, yeah. mm. Which also tells you that if we're able to shore up production, because there are some who are saying in terms of production capacity, there's so much more we can be doing. We're just doing a drop of, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> in a bucket. Out but, but, it. but it is. What, 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 what has been the, the rhetoric in that regard as far as PIAC is concerned? For us, I think it is essential for people to understand that we have only three producing fields in this country. Right. The Jubilee ten field, Jubilee. the TEN, and then the SGN field. Now, and we also have to understand that we have an exhaustible resource. Oil and gas is not forever. At some point, we would, it will be depleted once we are producing it. Hopefully, at some point, we will discover more wealth. Exactly. So that is what we should be looking at. Are we investing enough to ensure that we are able to discover new wells, we are able to discover new fields where we can produce from, and we need to understand that the productive lifespan of an oil field is somewhere between 10 to uh, sorry, somewhere between 20 to about 30 years. Mm. And now, if we take the Jubilee field, for example, we have been producing uh, from the Jubilee field from 2010 up to now. That's 20 13 years. years. That's about 13 years. So assuming its productive lifespan is actually just 25 years, it means that we have gotten to the peak. We are now actually declining. The, the ability of the field to produce more will begin to, uh, you know, decline. And so we should understand that uh, we are getting to the peak in but, terms but, but, of... But, but just on that point, it yes. will also be dependent on, yes, the, the entire, I don't know what the measurement is, uh, cubic meters or whatever, yes. of resource we have yes. down there, and then the quantum we've been... Extracting yes. over the years. Yes. It may not necessarily be the number of years because the quantum that is stored there will then also be a determinant. You it could make, even go past you, 15 you, years, depending you, on whether you are taking so much. Yes, you determine on a daily that. Basis you determine the much level much. of, uh, you know, the depletion rate mm. from uh, all these factors. Mm. So, in, to be able to say that it will take you about 20 to 30 years you know that you are considering the depletion rate as part of your analysis in doing so. Right. So, so far, what we are doing now, it will mean that the average life, that's why I use the average lifespan. The average lifespan of an oil field is actually between, some will say 25 to 30, some will say 20 to 30, whichever is the case. All I'm trying to say is that, assuming it is 25, mm. in the case of the Jubilee field, it means that we have done almost a half, and we are now on the decline. In the case of 10, we would have done about uh, 10 years now because 10 came on stream 2016. Mm. And in the case of SGN 2017 to now, we would have done just about 10 so years. So 10 would have done about as, seven as well. years thereabouts. So it means that we need to actually um, ensure that we put more investment into this industry to ensure that we are able to discover uh, more oil fields so that the production will continue. It will continue to have more production levels, which will give us more revenues. And then we know that we are on course. Otherwise, since it is an exhaustible natural resource, we will soon lose it. That's all I can say for now. <laughs> we'll soon lose it. And of course, uh, posterity will not have the benefit yeah. of uh, that. Let's, let's go back uh, just briefly to the District Assembly's yeah. uh, Common Fund. So with what has been happening, 1 plus percent in 2021, about 2.39% 2 in 2022, and the fact that per what Bodo and Co. fought for, we are looking at at least 5%. We've also discussed the consequences on the district assemblies. What, what is PIAC's recommendation as far as that specific one is concerned? And, and what, what alternatives do we have? What, looking at the financial space, the... the the tight financial yes. space we're in right now, yes. looking at the IMF program and the projections and all of that, what would you say realistically we can do? Can we meet 5% this year, the year to come? What is, what is the reality? You see, the law is the law. When the law says 5%, there are considerations to it. So for us, what we have recommended is that the ministry in determining, uh, sorry, the ministry should in the subsequent years, ensure that they comply. We say subsequent years always because 
for the year that we have reviewed and reported on, the enforcement is not on PIAC. The enforcement lies with the parliament and with His Excellency the President. Mm. They can engineer processes towards enforcing the infractions of the law. But for those who know, if you look at Section 58 of the law establishing PIAC itself, that the PRMA, it ensures that or it makes it clear that infractions of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act are essentially criminal in nature. Mm. And we all know that the only person with the prosecutorial powers in this country is the Attorney General of Ghana. So what it means is that to be able to effectively enforce the law, the Attorney General will have to be brought in squarely. And that could happen either through His Excellency the President, who is directing the Attorney General to do further investigations into this particular finding in, uh, of PIAC, and then to see if there are uh, established facts to proceed with prosecution, or Parliament summoning the Minister for Justice, and the Attorney General, and uh, probing further to see whether or not there are good bases for any prosecution, and directing the Attorney General to be able to do that. Those are the ways it could be done. There are those who think that because PIAC is doing such a fantastic job, that is what we have heard from the people of Ghana, and that then why not give powers to PIAC itself to prosecute where they think that uh, there is a clear infraction of the law. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we have given our recommendation, do not repeat that. You have no right to, I mean, give only half of what is required by law to the District Assembly's Common Fund. But in terms of enforcement at the moment, any other citizen of Ghana could also decide that on the basis of PIAC report, I want to test the law, you know, by going for other interpretation or seeking to do private uh, prosecution and all of that. So yes, at the moment, PIAC is somewhat, uh, our hands are tied in terms of enforcement. Mm. But we do always give our recommendations. I, I just had to bring that because, again, it would appear that you recommend that you recommend that you recommend. Yeah, we've been recommending for we've the been last... recommending for forever. For the last 11 years, and, 12 and, years. And the powers and that be... Some of them, to... they are able to follow through. Others, they are unable. But because the law is essentially a criminal legislation, if you, if you fail to do what is supposed to be done, that could be a crime. Or if you have done something contrary to the law, that is a crime. So because of that, we would have expected that for a decade, no person has so far been prosecuted That's the very for point infractions about to get to. of the law. And, and so and, for Pierre, realistic, yes. uh, uh, Nasir, so you look at it, the president, uh, president in, president out, they will not trigger the necessary processes for the yeah. attorney general yeah. to you know, follow suit. But at least parliament could. Well, Being the um, elected representatives well, 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 of the why, people why, of Ghana. Why do, you, why do you think that hasn't happened? Well, because of the majority system? It's, it's one of the reasons you could uh, think of. But there are instances where parliament is united on certain issues. Mm. I think that when it comes to management of our petroleum resources, our parliamentarians should be united uh, in doing what is right for the people of this country. But let's be realistic. So... In this instance, for example, the finance minister, yeah. uh, the finance minister would be culpable in a way. AFA, you know, the, the, the required payments from AFA to the district assemblies was not made. That is criminal. It, it means that the finance minister himself would have his head likely on the chopping board. Uh, and th this is his government in power. Realistically, how, how do you see that happening? Well, it is very difficult. Oftentimes, you would even have some of these, some of his deputies you know, and the rest are in parliament. Political How will, see that happening? Political will is a very important thing when it comes to enforcement of the law. Laws like these that require or that borders on criminality, if you don't have the political will to push through, it might be difficult. But I think that um, we cannot rule out our politicians uh, entirely. I believe that we have good persons in politics uh, who can say to hell with my political party per se and push through the agenda that will help the people of this country. So for us at PIAC, we are apolitical. We don't care whether it is MPP in power or NDC in power.
Mm. We are there essentially to represent the voice of the people of this country. And so where we think there are infractions of the law, we highlight them. Mm. And when we highlight them, we leave them to their politicians uh, you know, to now do what is right because they are the duty bearers under the law. Yeah, so when we speak to some of these issues, people should understand that we are speaking generally from our hearts after interrogating the data that has come before us from the various stakeholders in the industry. And, and so, so it, I mean, people shouldn't take it. In no, 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 not at all, not at all. If you look at how PIAC membership is formed, you would understand why I'm saying it. For example, and, 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 and I completely understand. I'm a nominee I'm, I'm just bringing it up so of the Bar Association. You can, you can actually yes. educate people more because Absolutely. the likes of Dr. Steve Mantea, yes. your former exactly. chairperson. I mean, there's nothing in there. There's no interest. So not at all. I'm a nominee of the Ghana Bar Association. Mm. And the Ghana Bar Association can recall me if I am not doing things rightly. Mm. And for four years now, I have been representing the Ghana Bar Association on PIAC. Of course, for some of us who are doing four years now, by September, we are out of this committee. And then new, a new member would be appointed or nominated by the Bar Association to replace me. And all these things happen to check us also that you are not easily cowed in after four years. You are now used to all the ministers and the stakeholders that you are unable to do your work very well. So it is a tenor system. Two years, renewable another two years if you're... Uh, your constituency, yeah. If your constituency right. thinks that you are doing well, they may return you after two years. If they think you are not doing well after two years, they bring another person to replace you. We also have another group of PIAC members who just come three years straight. Those are the groups that do the rotation system. So, for example, you have the Christian groups. We have the Catholic Bishops Conference. We have the Charismatic uh, group. Yeah. So, if you represent the Charismatic group after three years, you are not getting any renewal. So it's three, three years. You go, then the Catholic bishops may bring another person for another three years. In the case of Ghana Bar Association, which is just a single uh, group or entity, the fe that member, that same member can do two years with the liberty of the Ghana Bar Association to renominate him for place. another right. two years. Right. And that is what has happened to both myself and my predecessor, uh, uh, Dr. St uh, Stevens. And uh, I, I would just like to say that your reports, your work over time has really been refreshing and it's given us a lot to reflect on as a country and, and definitely we stand with you. But there's a key finding, uh, the industrialization priority area. Yeah. Key, because I have always said that we, if we want to make Ghana that land flowing with milk and honey, industrialization is the way to go. But yeah. interestingly, if you look at the IPA, you would find that, per the report, 9.29 million was given. That, that constitutes about just 0.2% of the entire AFA total. Yes. Now, what should have gone to the, the IPA should have been over 200 million, if, I am, uh, if memory serves. And if you look at the percentage that was actually given, it was just over, what, 4%, I think 4.29% yes. that, was, that was yielded. That is a pittance. It's even less than 5%. What, what, what does this indicate uh, from the findings? This, and it's not just the, the IPA. If you look at the GIIF, that's another you know, area, especially when we're talking about health infrastructure. But let's start with the IPA. What, what does that really mean? Yeah, the industrialization priority area. First, um, the law gives an opportunity for the Minister for Finance to choose up to, and I'm using my words advisedly, up to four priority areas out of that's, that's 12 been. priority right. areas listed in the law mm. for a three-year uh, tenure of which you apply the annual budget funding amount to those four priorities. In simple areas. terms, out of the pool of 12, you select four? Yes. And then for those four, they become priority areas. Yes, yes. And then there are certain specific percentages that must go to As those As for areas. the percentages, they are not specific. Or funding that must go to those areas. Yes, there are no specific funding. Mm. But it is the duty of the government to select four priority areas. Of course, once you select an area as a priority, we expect that priority if you have budgeted 
that much for it, priority should be given to it, and then the budget applied to it. Mm. That is essentially the problem with the industrialization priority area. It is one of the four priority areas that the government selected. But as you yourself have observed, look at how meager it is, right? At the industrialization priority area received an amount of 9.29 million, which represents 0.2% of the total ABFA, uh, which is 4.4 billion. The disbursement, which represents 4.29% uh, of the uh, amount budgeted for the priority area for 2022, does not reflect giving priority to industrialization in the use of the ABFA. So the amount budgeted was 216.3. Exactly, 216.3. million. 9.29 was given. Yes. Which is very, very small, just 0.2%. What does that, that show? Amount. So, so even, it shows that the thematic areas for, we, we, we select them. Are we just selecting them because we must uh, without necessarily doing what goes into making them priority in the first you place? You know, PIAC has advocated in a recent report, that is our 10-year uh, petroleum revenue management uh, usage report, uh, which we commissioned uh, in 2022 from 2011 to 2020. We have advocated that um, in order for the minister to choose the three priority areas, they should do some kind of evaluation of how the three priority areas in the subsequent three years have been utilized, how they have fared and all of that, in order for them to choose um, the new three priority areas for parliamentary approval. But I'm told that the minister has been doing something like that, and we cannot um, say it is not true that they are doing so, but that is what they are claiming. But we feel that if actually we do those evaluations, then it is possible that some of these priority areas that we are pushing out should not be those that are out there. Because we also visit the communities, we speak with the indigents, and they tell us different stories of what they really need and all that. So for me, it is so bad, especially in this case, that industrialization is seen as a priority to government, but in terms of practical implementation, it has not been given the needed priority that it deserves. Some have argued that. As for budgeting, <laughs> you only project, and that it does not mean that when you budget this much for something, that is exactly how much you are going to spend. But we have a concern. Look at the difference in quantum between how much has been budgeted and how much has actually been spent mm. on the industrialization priority area. And then you will understand where PIAC is coming from. If it was even closer to the budgeted amount, uh, or even 50% of the budgeted amount, then PIAC will not be advocating uh, this way. But we do so because if indeed industrialization is a priority to government, then they should be spending close to the amount they have budgeted for industrialization. Otherwise, it cannot, in our eyes, be seen as a priority area. Let's talk about the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, the GIIF. Yeah. Now, at least you would realize that in 2021, almost 300 million, about 290 plus million was, uh, you know, channeled into that. Last year, it was over 600 million. That's, that's almost a, a three... Uh, turnover leap in terms of the figure. But you're still saying that more can be done and that, in fact, this should be channeled directly to the Ministry of Health when it comes to Agenda 111. Yeah. Please explain. Our case is simple. The Agenda 111, or one of the priority areas that we have, has to do with health itself. Mm. You know, fiscal infrastructure and service delivery in education and health. So... What we are advocating is that since Agenda 111 is essentially a health infrastructure issue, why didn't government push the amount, the whole of the amount that should go into the uh, Agenda 111 to that priority area through the Ministry for Health for purposes of the Agenda 111? Now, when you come to the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, the act establishing the fund is clear on how it should invest funds coming to it. It should be commercially in nature 
with the aim of some returns to the state. So the question we asked ourselves when we were doing our analysis was whether the Agenda 111 is in the nature of a commercial infrastructure that would bring some returns generally to Ghana per se. Mm. So we believe that since the Agenda 111 is something that could be categorized under the Ministry of Health, it is better for a government to rather push the whole of that amount to, through the Ministry of Health to ensure that the Ministry supervises the Agenda 111 project. If we want to give any money to the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund as demanded by law anyway, then we should allow the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund to use that funding to invest in what it thinks is best within the confines or dictates of the law establishing it. And so, so normally we would cite the um, Terminal 3, Kotoka Terminal 3, as an example, where some oil money, not the whole of the Terminal 3 was built with oil money, but some oil money went into the cost. And then we have been told that we are making some returns as a nation through citizens and international traveling, uh, citizens traveling internationally and uh, other persons coming in and all that. So we're seeking to advocate that for Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, we should give them the, the opportunity to use funds that are given to them from oil funds to apply in accordance with their law, nothing more. We don't want a case where government keeps directing GIF, do this with your money, do this with your money, when in fact there is a law governing how they should handle their finances. So in other words, the commercial infrastructure projects as well, you, you, you touch on that, yes. it should be applied in a certain way to ensure some continuity. Yes. And of course, these and that we can paying, monitor paying for themselves. Exactly, and that we can monitor mm. these returns and all that. Let's also talk about the GNPC. Yes. They are heavily in the mix. You mentioned Joel, J-O-H-L, uh, its subsidiary, if you like, among others. Yes. What, what, what is the, the, there's been a lot of concern about the GNPC in the last few years, sustainability, revenue flows, and all of that, and its role in a number of uh, cases, some of which have ended up in, in court and all of that. Uh, how well is the GNPC faring per this report? Um, we are currently unhappy at PIAC because of how GOHL is being treated. Mm. Of course, GNPC clearly disagrees with us on our position, but we will reiterate. Which is what? We will reiterate that the GOHL cannot just lift crude oil, sell them, and then keep the revenues to themselves without the revenues passing through the Petroleum Holding Fund. We maintain the PHF. that the PRMA, which is the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, is clear that all revenues accruing from upstream petroleum uh, uh, you know, uh, operations, whether directly or indirectly, constitute oil revenues and should first be paid into the Petroleum Holding Fund before they hit any other uh, you know, account. You will remember that in our 2023 semi uh, 2022 semi-annual report, we reported about an amount in excess of 100 million United States dollars, yeah. which was realized from a lifting by the JOHL, and uh, which monies were paid uh, straight to JOHL in their accounts offshore. And we had a problem with that because we thought that that was petroleum revenue that ought to have come to the petroleum holding fund. And then we advised against doing that. Then in the same year, after the same annual report, there had been two additional liftings by the JOHL, and the proceeds from those liftings, which now amounts in total to uh, over 200 million United States dollars, are still left with the JOHL. And we have a big problem with that. We think that this is an infraction of the law, and we, we are not going to rest on this one. At the moment, PIAC is trying to organize um, a round table where all the major stakeholders mm. would come together to have a significant debate. I mean, a very important debate on this because 
if we allow GMPC to utilize this avenue of doing things, I'm telling you, we are doomed. We are doomed because a very cunning GMPC boss will no longer use GMPC qua GMPC in the commercial uh, 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 you know, arrangement in this country. It will always create a subsidiary and make the same argument that Ghana can only benefit from the dividends that the subsidiary may declare and not from the liftings or the proceeds of the liftings that that subsidiary is taking. And if that happens, GMPC and you and I know, when will JOHL ever declare dividends in the first place? I mean, when will they declare uh, profits and uh, this much profit and then say that we are giving this much dividends to, to the Republic? There are certain things we shouldn't do as a nation. One of those would be to ensure that whether GMPC or any subsidiary of GMPC that is lifting our crude oil, the proceeds from that lifting should go straight to the petroleum holding fund. And I will make all the necessary, I will canvas all the necessary legal points uh, to buttress uh, this issue. GMPC is not just any other company. GMPC, by law, represents the commercial interest of the people of this country. And when you even look at the acquisition of JOHL itself, you use our state resources to acquire an entity. Yeah. Then you turn around and tell us that we have no interest in it unless you declare dividends. <laughs> like, seriously? As, I mean, for us at PIAC, it doesn't make any sense. And we think that we will be de debate this issue until finality is brought to bear on this. Well, what finality, really? I mean, I'm looking well, here about the, the cap of $100 million and yes. how you say that in 2022, for example, a proper application of the formula would have returned a cap of $638.87 million. So yes. we are bleeding, obviously. For whatever reason, we are subscribing to these arrangements. Only God knows. But... On the point of you're not resting until something is done, the reality is, um, let me be blunt, you can't do anything, can you? Yeah. There's nothing you can do. You see, you are, you're practically toothless bulldog. You see, you see, the important thing... And to that's note, my problem. The really. important thing to note is that if we did not have an entity like PIAC in Ghana, mm. by now we wouldn't even be talking about petroleum. I wholly revenues. agree. I wholly agree yes, on that. We won't even be talking about petroleum revenue. But the, point, ask the, yourself. The, the point to be made is while you come out with all of these yes. beautiful reports, yes. fantastic, the powers that be simply jettison them. They don't apply oh, you them. You see, what I want to say is that even though enforcement has been a problem, there is an essential role that these reports are playing right. and then the findings are playing. Definitely. I mean, they also feed into the reports that even Deterrence international organizations one, yes. use as well. They are queried all over as to why ABCD is happening. Piac report says ABCD, and they are queried all over. Mm. And I tell you, look at our uh, revenues from mineral resources, for example. We've been mining gold, bauxite, diamond for over 100 years. Can you point to one single infrastructure in this country where you can say that this is where our oil, uh, mineral revenue went to? Even some few projects that you can point to and say that mineral revenues have been used for this and they are identifiable. It is difficult to make out. How we uh, you know, account for our mineral revenue is a difficult thing. It is so much the case that the Petroleum Revenue Management Act is so good a law that we have people now calling for a revenue, uh, sorry, a mineral revenue management law, mm. or expanding the application of the Petroleum Revenue Management law to cover, to cover accountability in the mineral revenue management. And as for that, so, it's, it's, it's another ball game altogether. Because yes. there are years when you can have Ghana declaring and so in now, entirety that it has sold this amount of gold. Yes. And then one country will tell you that <clears> what we got from Ghana was was so much more. So yeah. why the disparities? Yeah. It's, it's, that's, but that's another question. So uh, transparency and accountability are important things in the management of natural resources, mm. especially the revenues. Mm. And PIAC is essentially helping this country to achieve those two. In terms of transparency, it's no longer a question. Everybody knows that PIAC has four duty bearers 
to make things so transparent that they cannot run away from it. Because when GMPC gives me their report, I try to ensure that I do uh, my analysis of whether or not it's the same reporting that is coming from, let's say, Petroleum Commission, especially in respect of data concerning production uh, in particular, right? Because PC will do their monitoring and they will have their production figures. GMPC will have their production figures. The international oil companies themselves will have their production figures. When they don't reconcile, if we are unable to reconcile these figures, we call them to a validation meeting for them to reconcile them for us. So we simply don't just take information you give us. We go beyond the raw information you give us to interrogate other data we receive from other entities before we come to a conclusion. Mm. So for me, the work PIAC is doing is a huge one. Some of us will go, but we will remain advocates for PIAC, whoever becomes PIAC uh, members or executive will continue to support them on this course. Mm. It's a great course, I must say. It is. It definitely is. And I, I, that was why I was doffing my hat to you, my imaginary hat, <laughs> to you earlier on the show. But uh, the, the failure for implementation to be brought to bear, and like you mentioned, some of what the, 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 the ally and what it stipulates border on is basically criminality. And it's being you know, flouted with... Yeah, for example, you the, just indicated... The, the greatest impunity. I mean. You indicated the cap on the stabilization fund. The hundred million Which is the ally, the hundred million dollars. Right. What is the genesis of this? Now, <clears throat> in 2019, we had a legislative instrument which is supposed to operationalize the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. And that itself was problematic. When I say problematic, in terms of the timing of the legis uh, that legislation, we had the Petroleum Revenue Management Act in 2011. And the act says that we should have a legislative instrument as soon as possible to operationalize the, the law. But we waited for eight, nine years for us to have that legislation. You can imagine the kind of infractions that would have gone on between 2011 and 2019 when the legislative instrument was finally enacted. Now, having been enacted, the Legislative instrument says that in order to put a cap on the stabilization fund, you have to consider the average annual budget funding amount of three years. And those three years, we are referring to the current financial year, the year immediately before the current financial year, and the year immediately after the current financial year. Those ones will be, the, that one will be like the projected ABFA for that year. You consider them and you take their average. That is where you place the cap on the stabilization fund. We are saying that for the year 2022, if we had correctly followed the formula, it would have returned a cap of a cap in excess of 600 million United States dollars. 683 million. Yes. Meanwhile, it is still pegged at 100 million. And the 100 million ton came in 2020, uh, transitioning in 2019, 2020 when COVID-19 hit, and the minister was forced to go to parliament for us to be able to, uh, for parliament to reduce the cut to around okay, 100 so million. I, I just checked, it's actually 638.87 yes. million. Exactly. So that is how the cap should have been. But the minister retained the 100 million dollar that was approved by parliament in 2020. Now, our problem is this. Whenever you go to parliament with your budget, you know that is the appropriation bill, technically. And when your appropriation bill is approved for you, it is for a fiscal year and not more. For one financial year, one fiscal year and no more. So if parliament approved 100 million United States dollars as a cap on the Ghana Stabilization Fund, the expectation for PIAC is that if you wanted to retain the same 100 million the following year, you go back to you parliament back to for parliament. approval. Right. And for 2022, you go back to parliament for approval. Now, since that approval, the minister had not, we have checked all the budgets from so that it's period just up been to now. Rolled over, basically. Yes, you has, it has just been rolled over. And then the minister's, uh, uh, so the ministry's argument is that this has been approved by parliament. And we say no, parliament approved it as part of the budget as part of the appropriation bill. And the appropriation bill is approved for just a fiscal year. 
And so if it was approved for a fiscal year, and you just assume that it is approved forever, it cannot be the position of the law. Mm. So for us, we have so a problem that you, with that. The, the, the we think that flagrant. Yes, we think breach. that it is a breach. Mm. The minister ought to have revisited the, the formula provided in the legislative instrument. And if he had revisited that formula, it would have returned a cap in excess of 600 million. Be, be, before we get to the myriad recommendations that you've made, the, the crucial ones among them, because you've already started talking about some of them. In this specific instance, you've already made mention of a, a sort of call on parliament to be more, maybe, proactive when it comes to some of these. What would be your call in that regard, especially in respect of the finance minister? Because a lot of these infractions, in fact, they, they are all under him, you basically. See? The APFA, from the APFA to the IPA to everything else we are talking about. I don't know who the other duty bearers are, but what would be your charge to parliament and parliamentarians on this in respect of or vis-a-vis -vis the situation, vis-a-vis -vis the finance minister? Like I indicated earlier, to the best of our knowledge, we know that Parliament has been interrogating the PIAC reports. Mm. And just on Tuesday, last Tuesday, I saw on the order paper of Parliament that they were considering our 2021 annual report. report. I, I think so. I mean, the report of the Finance Committee on PIAC's 2021 annual. I saw something like that. So yes, we appreciate the work that the Finance Committee and Parliament generally uh, you know, I've been doing with our reports and all that. The problem has been, as you have indicated, when you go out and people interrogate you and say, ah, you people, you make all sorts of findings and recommendations and nothing happens. Then we say, oh, our duty by law is to report to parliament. Right. Our duty by law is to report to His Excellency the President and then to you, the citizens of the Republic of Ghana, which we have been doing. Beyond that duty, the law has not imposed on us any duty of enforcement. In fact, it has not given you don't have the any power. powers of enforcement right. to PIAC. And like we have indicated, the legislation itself establishing PIAC is like a criminal legislation. When I say it's a legislation that uh, you know, is couched as um, a criminal legislation because infractions of that law are seen as criminal offenses. And criminal offenses, as I indicated, the prosecution is in the hands of the Attorney General, but the, the Attorney General, punitive yeah, actions. but the Attorney General may decide to cede some of his prosecutorial powers to any other entity for purposes of enforcing the petroleum revenue infractions. Do you, do you of think the we should get to that point? There are people advocating on the back of the that. history. Do you think we should get to that point? Where there are people. The Attorney General's powers should be clipped in a way and given to, let's say. Uh, a body, I don't know whether PIAC specifically, but for, for enforcement purposes. That's why I'm saying that when we go around the country, there is a strong call by citizens of this country. Do you have any parliamentary advocates on that? I'm not too sure about that yet. I'm not too sure about any parliamentary. But there is a strong advocacy from the people that PIAC, either PIAC or an independent body, mm. like we did with a special prosecutor, where we have ceded some of the prosecutorial powers of the Attorney General and given to the special prosecutor to prosecute cases concerning corruption. Some are of the view that because of the repeated infractions of the law, I mean the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, we should be able to give PIAC some powers of prosecution. But what it will mean is that they will, uh, PIAC will need to have a legal department or a prosecution's department and build the capacities of the prosecution department to be able to do that. You know that the uh, Attorney General has ceded some of his prosecutorial power to Senate to be able to prosecute offenses concerning uh, infractions around the Senate law. Yeah. So in the same vein, the Attorney General could cede some of his prosecutorial power to PIAC or to any other entity that is established by law for purposes of prosecuting cases concerning infractions of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. It's the same thing that we have police officers prosecuting some motor uh, traffic offenses uh, in our courts. That particular um, prosecution, prosecutorial power is in the hands of the Attorney General. Mm. But through either an executive instrument or a legislative, legislative instrument, the Attorney General is able to cede some of those powers to them. Or through an act of parliament, the Attorney General's powers of prosecution has been ceded to, say, the special prosecutor for corruption-related offenses. 
So would the Attorney General be ready? Would Parliament be willing? Would the President have the political will to see that enough of the infractions on this particular law and that let's do something unique where any finance minister or any other duty bearer under that law will know that if I do this and it is not in line with the law, I'm likely to be facing prosecution the very next moment. If we are able to do that, it will help us greatly. So these, this now. recommendation is not here, <laughs> but oh, we have. But we no, have. No, I'm, I'm yes. just saying that yes. this has come so, off. Yes, just off when the, you ask the question, of the cuff. Yeah. But let's let's get to some of the recommendations you make on the back of this uh, latest report and what it shows. Uh, you say there is a need for Ghana to speed up the sustainable development of its petroleum resources to reverse the decline in production and all of that. But from from the discussions we've had, from the GIIF to the IPA. Uh, the industrialization priority area to GNPC and, and the role it's playing in there and the capping uh, to everything else that we've had, you know, discussed on the show. What would be your major recommendations, the most important ones that you would like to leave all of us with? Well, we are talking about the industry today because we are producing oil. Mm. And so the first recommendation is to be able to continue to have I mean, to produce optimal oil, production optimal of oil. production of uh, uh, crude oil. And if you look at that as our first recommendation, except that we have been very careful to add the word sustainable. Sustainable because there is currently um, a thesis globally that advocate that we should move away from fossil fuels to green energy. And therefore, uh, those people will be advocating that Leave the oil in the ground and uh, let's focus on renewable and energy. Spoken about that realistic, yes. because we are also on that curve exactly. when it comes to development. And in Africa, uh, and then the developing world, they say no. We would rather prefer what we call energy progression. Mm. So the energy progressionists argue that you people have developed your economies uh, so well. And, exactly. Uh, allow us to also use our natural, our God-given natural resources to also develop our economies because our economies are essentially. Uh, you know, trawling behind you, we are not doing well. To be able to do well, we will need to utilize our resources and all that. So give us the opportunity. So the energy progressionist, I am an energy progressionist. For me personally, I would advocate. Uh, and I know there are so many members of PIAC who uh, advocate along those lines. Give us the opportunity um, to utilize our petroleum resources to develop this country. But we are saying that in doing so, let us do so sustainably. So we, at the back of our minds, we should put in place structures that would ensure that the environment is not unduly disturbed. So you look at our uh, mineral uh, resources and how we are mining gold and all that, the environmental concerns, we should be able to check those concerns in the oil and gas resources with the benefit of the lessons that we have learned from the mineral uh, resources. So we advocate for more investment in the, in the sector. We advocate for GMPC to be given the opportunity to invest more. So I'm an advocate of GMPC actually getting more funding uh, for investment purposes to ensure that we have more uh, you know, oil coming on stream. Mm. The only problem that some of us have had with GMPC is how they have apportioned money that comes to them and spent. So for example, you would realize that they spend so much on recurrent expenditure and all that, and not on the core mandate that GMPC is giving uh, you know, under the law. And so we are advocating that if the monies come to you, we want to be able to see that you are spending so much of the money on your core mandate and not on what you call corporate social investment which is corporate social responsibility. And there have been instances in the past where even monies have been given to um, traditional authorities and all of that from GMPC. Uh, Ghana Black Stars at some point was being sponsored by GMPC. So you ask yourself, you, are, you have a core mandate. Why do you depart from your core mandate to be doing some of these things? They advocate that it is corporate social investment. And we, we, we appreciate the fact that every international oil company or national oil company where it's sought, 
must do some corporate social uh, responsibility. They call it corporate social investment. However, the quantum of money you pump into your corporate social investment should not be nearing what you are pushing into your core mandate. Right. And that has been our problem uh, with GMPC on the back. Uh, recently, GMPC is doing so well uh, in the Voltaire Basin, which is one of the petroleum basins of Ghana. It is onshore. GMPC alone is the one that is there. We don't have any partner with GMPC on the Voltaire Basin at the moment. They are doing exploration, and we will advocate that the government gives them all the needed support to ensure that we at least are able in the shortest possible time to discover some oil uh, in the Voltaire Basin, which will also aid in our, uh, uh, you know, up in our production uh, volumes, and that can also translate to some revenues uh, for Ghana in the future. All right. And so, yes, that is one big uh, recommendation we will give. The other big recommendation will be about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the gap between the law and then the enforcement. That is not how we have couched it in our recommendation, but I'm combining a number of recommendations on this one. The fact that if the law requires this, do that. Don't do it halfway and leave it. So, for example, you look at the DACF. If the law says 5%, why give 1.5%? It is not as if the money didn't come. It came. So the remainder, what did you do with it? The remainder that was supposed to have gone there and you didn't send it there, what did you do with it? Right. And how are you accounting for that? So those are important things we think we should take into consideration. The very final bit, it's a very you know, short bit. At the tail end of your report, you say it is the expectation of the committee that the general public will read the report and provide feedback via secretariat at piacghana.org uh, for those of you who would like to reach out. But what, what I find curious about that, how widely is this disseminated? You want the generality of Ghanaians to read it and contribute, give feedback and all of that. I don't know what the response has been, but, and I don't know how many people actually read these reports, but what, what push have you put through in that regard sure. to ensure that a lot of Ghanaians are familiar with your reports, and, and that is also a way of putting pressure on the powers that be? Yeah. So you see, first, it is a requirement by law that we bring, we publish our reports on the state uh, newspapers yeah. and bring it generally to the notice of the people of Ghana. And also, to be able to do our assessment, we can't do any proper assessment without feedback from the people. Mm. But So this request at the end, tail end of our report is uh, just an additional um, uh, you know, provision that we have made to ensure that we get uh, adequate feedback. Otherwise, we have other ways of getting the feedback. So like I told you, we just returned only last week from regional engagements. We went to Upper West, we went to Bono. Uh, in the next few months, we'll be going to other regions of the, of, the, of the country. Last year alone, we did about seven regions of the country, uh, going around to various districts, interacting with the people, having regional and district fora to debate oil and gas. And we take the feedback from all these places you know, to help us do our independent assessment of how best we are utilizing the oil revenue. So essentially, they themselves, the people of Ghana knows we have been coming to them. We come to their doorsteps. But we are encouraging those who, you know, sometimes you go there, they are not able to uh, advocate all the issues that they have. So if you have additional issues which you have not yet been able to inform us, you, are, you can easily use this particular avenue. Reach out to PIAC. Tell us what your concerns are. And then they will be taken into consideration. Uh, in, in doing our analysis and may feature into the, the next report of PIAC. Well, Nasir, it's been quite a conversation and uh, we're grateful that every time we call, you actually take, uh, seize the opportunity to join us here and educate all of uh, the populace about the work you're doing and what the latest reports uh, actually show. Thank, Thank you, you for so your time. Much. Thank you so much. Too. And that is uh, Nasir Alpha Mohammed. He is vice chairman of uh, PIAC, and he joined us here for this conversation. The ball now 
is in the court of the powers that be. It's in our court as well for us to read the report, for us to give the feedback, for us to hold the feet of those who are accountable to the fire of accountability. But the rest of that ball rests in their court in terms of implementation. So, Mr. Finance Minister Kino Foriata, the ball is also in your court. Stay with us on the AM show because up next we have a number of issues we're going to be delving into. One of them hosting the Ghana National Fire Service. Their chief officer will be joining us on the show. Do say we'll be right back. Welcome back on the AM show. And even before we get to the Ghana National Fire Service, we're going to be contemplating unemployment amount, uh, among myriad other elements. Now, uh, that is in the latest report by the Ghana Statistical Service. And close to 7.5 million persons remain uh, employed throughout the three quarters out of the about 11 million persons. Now, this also indicates that across the three quarters, about 3.5 million persons were moving in and out of employment, depicting some vulnerability. But of key interest to us as we speak to the government statistician this morning, Professor Enim, has to do with two out of every three unemployed individuals being female. Now, what exactly is happening? We have the government statistician, Professor Enim, uh, joining the conversation. A very good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Benjamin, and good morning to the listeners. I always say this. We are so grateful that every time we call on you, you make the time. Thank you so much uh, for this. Now, per this Benjamin. latest survey that has been conducted, this latest uh, report, what would you say are the crucial points? I mean, I've already made mention of a number of them, but in terms of the inflows and outflows of employment, basically, the numbers of people that are unemployed, what can you tell us on the back of that? Thank you, and I really appreciate the fact that you're taking the conversation beyond the rate of unemployment, the rate of employment, which has dominated our um, media and policy space when it comes to labor statistics. So what this report um, tries to do is change the narrative away from that and begin to talk about what you exactly uh, mentioned, if we have 11 million people and we have 7.5 million people who across the three quarters were um, employed, and the 3.5 million people moving in and out of poverty is going to initiate the conversation around our stock of employment and our flow of employment. One of the things that we always talk about from a policy point of view is I'm creating X number of jobs. And if those X number of jobs um, leads to employment going up, the questions that we need to ask ourselves is whether the employment that we've created, can we sustain it over time? or it's just for a short period and people over two, three months, they move in and out of jobs. The other thing that I thought we should change the narrative and start talking about is, if you say these people are employed, what are the characteristics of their employment in terms of their likelihood of leaving employment completely and being um, unemployed? And how does it play out across formal and informal sectors? Then the third one is people that we say have multiple um, socioeconomic burdens, that is, they are not employed, they are food insecure, and they are multidimensionally poor. So these are the three broad areas that we want to change the narrative on labor statistics to begin to focus on as a country. And again, we want that to feed into the policy space rather than using that to assess whether we are doing well or not as a country. Now, since you've already started talking about the multidimensionally poor, the UN uh, started uh, provoking us, so to speak, last year on the back of same. In fact, it made mention of the fact that on the back of COVID-19, a lot of Ghanaians, many more, had fallen into that bracket of multidimensional poverty. But per this report, uh, the Annual Household Income and Expenditure Third Quarter Labor Force Report, you say that over 1.7 million Ghanaians representing 13.2% uh, of the labor force were unemployed with some unable to find jobs, unable to find food to eat, 
and being multidimensionally poor. Someone may ask, what, what exactly does all of this mean? Yes, yeah, yeah, some people are not able to feed, others uh, are unable to do other things that the employed, those in the labor force would be able to do. But multidimensional poverty, what exactly is the breakdown and what is the statistic for us here in Ghana? Okay, so let me look at this from how the three dimensions come to, come to play. So the first thing we need to appreciate is that I could be looking for a job. I'm not getting the job. In the reference period, I didn't do any work. I don't have any work to, to, go, to go back to. But I could have safety nets. I could have people around, you, around me that through remittances, through transfers, they can support to ensure that I'm able to meet a three square meal anytime. I'm able to ensure that I'm eating healthy diets. So then I satisfy the condition of um, being food secure. The third dimension is that I could be out of work. I'm available for work. I'm not getting it. I'm food insecure, but I'm out of school in terms of, um, for instance, two years um, lagging behind the level that I'm expected to be, which is one of the 12 dimensions that we use in, mo in measuring multidimensional poverty. Another dimension that we use in, mo in measuring multidimensional poverty is whether I have access to a public service through a national health insurance. Another dimension is whether I'm living in a household that we are more than four in a room, it's overcrowded, and we are likely to have challenges when it comes to any um, health um, pandemic. So if you are going through all, th all three, that is, you cannot find work, you are available for work, you don't have any coping strategy to ensure that you get your three square meal to ensure that you eat healthy diet. You make sure that you are at the right level of um, schooling. You make sure that you are living around living conditions that would not impede on your health situation. Then you are not um, triple bedding. But if all the three are negative, i.e., you are not employed, you are food insecure, and you are multidimensionally poor, then it becomes a, it becomes a challenge, and we say you are triple bedding. Mm. The conversation around poverty again, either to has focused on consumption poverty, consumption expenditure poverty. So we say that, how, how much do I spend a day? How much calories do I need to ensure that I'm living a healthy life? And once I'm not spending up to that amount, I'm classified as, po as poor. And that is from a monetary point of view. In recent times, that is since the 2010 census, we've tried to increase the frequency of multidimensional poverty which gives us poverty status from a non-monetary perspective. So from a non-monetary perspective, just like we do for the Human Development Index, we have 12 dimensions in the case of multidimensional poverty, the living conditions of people, issues around education, and issues around health. And then we've identified those 12 indicators. And then set an average threshold and say that once you are not able to meet this threshold, then you are multidimensionally poor. Benjamin, all that GSS is trying to do now is to expand the scope of statistics to get policymakers to really know the intervention that solves particular problems. Moving forward, we are going beyond the multidimensional poverty and in our upcoming Ghana Living Standard Survey, we're going to tackle the issue of learning poverty. Benjamin, once I'm bring, wh why I'm bringing this up is what you said earlier on in terms of the aftermath effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, mm. when we had people having different experiences with learning, the experience that we saw from the um, 2021 population housing census, which tells us that we have educated people who cannot, what I mean by educated is people who have, for instance, finished JHS, but cannot read and write in any language with understanding. So we really need to tackle the concept of poverty from a multiple perspective, not multidimensional um, poverty, but from a multiple perspective, i.e. consumption exp expenditure, so that if the government is giving handouts to ensure that people get income to meet their caloric level, it solves the consumption expenditure. From a multidimensional poverty, if government wants to solve the issues around overcrowding, if government wants to step up health insurance to ensure that people are really using it, not in terms of people who have, have registered for it, we solve that problem. And then from a learning point of view, if you want to solve poverty, you can solve it based on the evidence that we're going to come up with when we do the Ghana Living Standards. So that is where we are headed to as a service. Now, interestingly, on the back of uh, multidimensional poverty, the report shows 
that the number of persons who were unemployed and multidimensionally poor remained at an average of about 615,000 persons. Now, this fluctuated at a point there was a marginal increase of about 20,000. We, we began the conversation you know, by talking about, yes, the fact that it shouldn't just be employment and unemployment figures. But you know, we've been told time and again, sometimes buttressed with figures from the Ghana Statistical Service that X number of persons have been employed. Recently, I heard the vice president talking about 2 million uh, you know, people who had been employed over time. When you look at these figures vis-a-vis -vis our unemployment uh, rate, what, what, what does it show? You were saying earlier that, of course, any gains that are made or mention of employment must be commensurable with the increment in, in the core number of people who have been employed. It shouldn't just be people who are employed briefly for three months and then they go out. What does this really mean? So the, thank you, Benjamin. The first thing that I talked about was a conversation around the stock of employment and the flow of employment. So we are clear in our minds the stock of employment once we do an exercise like this, and we can concretely say that at this point in time, this is the number of people who have been employed. We can create jobs and at any point in time say that at this point in time, this is the number of jobs that we've created. But anytime we create jobs, let's keep in mind that it will coincide with a time that people are exiting jobs and people are losing jobs. So you are not too clear of whether the job creation would necessarily translate into the stock of employment at any point in time. So that is the first clarity we should have. The second clarity, based on what I said earlier on, is because we followed the same people over three quarters, we are able to say that at any point in time when we followed people, we found out that about 11 million people at any point in time are employed. But for those that have been consistently employed across all the three quarters, that is the first nine months of 2022, it was 7.5 million people who were at any point in time employed. And that is why the conversation around the flow, the transitions, the mobility is critical. So if you created jobs in the first quarter, and in the second quarter, people exited and went out of the labor force to, to pursue um, further education, which is not a bad thing, it affects your stock. But you can only track it if you do it from a flow perspective rather than a stock perspective. And this is the conversation that we say that it should be reflected in how we target the 3.5 million people. That is the difference between the 11 million and the 7.5 million people that over a, a nine months period, they moved in and out of employment. And indeed, some of them left employment status, were unemployed and went back to employment status. Interesting dynamics, and, and that is also buttressed by more of what you have shared with us, uh, talking about the number of persons unemployed, food insecure, and multidimensionally poor, decreasing by 78,000. But then, uh, that was between the first and second quarters, but then there was a rebound in the third quarter with 55,000 uh, of an increase. We can also look at the number of unemployed persons as, as a component of our labor force. About 13.2% of the entire labor force across the first three quarters of last year, that is about 157,000 persons experiencing an unemployment spell. Uh, maybe we can stick to this Catman period, but when you look at the last, let's say, the last year into now, Prof, what, what, has, the, what has the trend been like in terms of unemployment maybe we can segregate it if you if you can address the statistics i'm not trying to put you on the spot if you can then you go ahead uh, unemployment generally and youth unemployment especially th there's a reason i'm asking that so benjamin you've put to the fore a number of issues and let me clarify um, them please so the first issue is we have an understanding of what is ghana's unemployment rate ghana's unemployment rate rate based on the three quarters that we've done the analysis, has, moved, has ranged between 13.4 and 13.9, which is not significantly different from what we saw in 2021 population housing census, which was also 13.4. So the unemployment rate in Ghana has moved around 13.4 to 13.9. It, has, it doesn't change much. Indeed, it is for that reason that we say that we need to move the conversation away from what your unemployment rate is. The second point that you put across had to do with the unemployment spell. And for RAS at Ghana Statistical Service, this is where we want policy to target because 
we can drill further down and show the characteristics of the 157,000 people that you talked about. The, what we meant by unemploy, unemployment spell is that these 157,000 people were part of the 1.72 million people that were unemployed in the first quarter, were part of the 1.73 people who were unemployed in the second quarter, and were part of the 1.76 million people who were unemployed in the third quarter. But they consistently were unemployed across the three quarters. And this really affects the um, target of ensuring that we don't leave anyone behind. Because these people are consistently left out of the labor market. The other thing that we thought this report should highlight has to do with, of the 1.76 million people who were unemployed in the first quarter, 520,000 of them gained employment in the second quarter. But in the third quarter, 110,000 of them lost their, were, were unemployed. So they gained employment and went back, to, went, went back to unemployed status. And this is something that we should think about in terms of what led people to move in and out of unemployment status. In relation to the neither employed ed in education or training, mm. that, 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 that component also moved up from 19.7% to uh, 25%. Benjamin, again, I, I think that is a misrepresentation. We need to clarify, clarify that. Mm. In the 2021 population housing census and in the first two quarters of the annual household income and expenditure survey, we put the youth unemployment figure as ranging between 18 and 19 percent. So you're absolutely right. Youth unemployment is 18, 19 percent. The neither in education, employment and training is not youth unemployment. It is telling us that this is, don't think about this as an intersection, think about people who are not doing any of these three. So it's not conditioned okay. on the fact that I'm unemployed. Let me find out whether you are not in education. Let me find out whether you are not in training. Then in that case, you would want to relate that conversation around need to unemployment. So let's treat the two statistics differently. The neither in education, employment, and training is saying that if you are between the age 15 to 35, you should be doing one of these things. You are either working or you are in education or training. So the measurement for that is we take the youth population 15 to 35 and we ask you, are you, in, are you in employment? If you are not, we take you out. We ask you, are you in education or training? If you are not, we take you out. Then we divide that by the youth population. Contrary to unemployment rate, where we find out number of persons who are not um, working, available for working, and then divide that by those employed and those unemployed, which is the labor force. So these are two different statistics. Having said that, it is important to have a conversation around the 25% because it is striking. And you ask yourself, if they are not doing any of these, what are they potentially doing? We didn't get a chance to drill down on that, but what we've done with the data to guide policy make makers is that, how best can you solve this problem of 25%, which is equivalent of 2.5 million persons? So, it's even higher than the 1.76 persons that we say they are unemployed. Mm. So among our youth, 15 to 35, we have 2.5 million of them who are neither in education, employment, or, or training. So we look at that analysis and say that, how does it vary for each of the single years? That is, at age 15, what do you see? At age 16, what do you see? Right down to age 35. And then tell government that if you target this particular age, you are going to get the maximum returns. So we do that and we realize that the number of people who are not in education, employment, and training reduces by age. But it peaks at the age of 21. So if you really want to address the issue of neither in employment, education, or training, target persons at age, age, age 21. And then one of the hypotheses or what we summarize is that it's possibly the transition period from school to work so then we need to begin to think about interventions around that transition from school to work, given that it peaks at age 21. Interesting points. Uh, you keep saying that for some of the data, you couldn't go further uh, beyond the point you went. What, what, is, what, is the, uh, what is keeping you from going further? Is it funding? What is it? I just want to get a grasp of that. 
No, no, it's it's not funding at all. It's simply the amount of data that you'd want to put out at any point in time. You would agree with me that these statistics are pretty new to us. We are now talking about mobility, vulnerability, triple burden. So we just felt that you better um, do it in a piecemeal way so that people get a better appreciation um, of it. We, as you as you realize, for the 2021 population housing census, we did a general report and then we started doing thematic briefs. So this is exactly what we're going to do with the annual household income and expenditure survey. We're going to bring academics on board so that we can look at the analysis beyond what we've done, which is simply looking at only two variables at any point in time. So there's real scope. And also we are asking policymakers to bring us to the table and tell us exactly the kind of analysis that they want so that we can drill down and get the data for them. So there's still scope for us to um, do that. It has nothing to do with funding at this stage. Let's, let's take a look at this very worrying statistic and, and do confirm whether we got this one right. Two out of every three unemployed individuals are female. Now, that, that would show that if whatever the pool may be, it means about, what, 66% of, of that would exactly. be female. And our population, over 50% is female, according to the last... Uh, population and housing census. I, I found that very worrying. What are the real dynamics in there? So let's let's get the numbers um, right. I mean, the, you got it right, but I just want to go into the specifics. So as you rightly said, during the third quarter, we identified 1.76 persons who were on a million persons who were unemployed. 1.76 million persons who were unemployed. And out of this, we had 1.17 of them being females, which if you do the simple math, it takes you to the 66, 67%, um, which is giving unemployment in, in Ghana a female um, face. The immediate observation that we've made is look at the people who are employed, that is the females who are employed, and look at the kinds of jobs that they are, that, that they are doing. And yesterday during the release, we, we talked about the vulnerable um, employment. So we did two things. Look at vulnerable employment from the perspective of people who are self-employed without employees and people who are contributing to family work. And we identified a 21 percentage point between females and males. So from the perspective of the kind of work that females are doing, it's more vulnerable in the sense that they are doing more of non agreed self-employed work without employees and they are contributing to family work. So this is the kind of job that um, they are doing. Then the second thing that we look at is the movement of people in employment and out of, out, out of employment. So we took the first quarter data and looked at people who were employed in the first quarter and took the third quarter data and looked at people who were unemployed in the third quarter. And then we said that if you were unemployed in the third quarter, let us look at the kind of work that you were doing in the first quarter. And we identified that, again, most of the work that those who were unemployed in the third quarter, they did in the first quarter were jobs that I talked about earlier on. They were um, self-employed, non agreed persons without employees, and they were also contributing um, family um, workers. And then these people quickly moved out of poverty, sorry, unemployment, sorry, employment between the first quarter and the third quarter. So in the third quarter, they became unemployed while in the first quarter they were employed. And we see females dominating this group of people relative to males. Mm. How worrying a statistic is that for our developmental uh, purposes? Looking at the fact that, well, the females are more than the males, I don't know what the real dynamics are in terms of the labor force proper and how many females are in there. But when you look at the dynamics, if two thirds of them are female, what are the implications? So let me tackle this from two perspectives. One is the opportunity for us to drill down to say that, okay, for the females that we've identified, where are they and whether they are dominating our informal space or whether they are dominating our services space. And these are further analysis that we've done in the report that we've, we, we released yesterday, but did not necessarily do it by sex. So you don't find it in the report. But one of the things that we all expect to see is that we're going to find more females in the services sector because our female, our services sector 
is dominated by trade. We're going to find a lot of our females in our informal um, sector. So the sector of their employment might be contributing to that. So this is lending itself to a conversation on, as a country, which of the sectors do you want to see it drive the economy and our agenda towards formalizing what we currently see in the informal sector. And in an earlier discussion, I did indicate that the informality simply means is that we don't have a hold of what we are doing, we don't know where they are, and we are not too clear of exactly the extent to which they are contributing to our development trajectory. So if we really want to get a hold of this and address the um, issue of female, we should get more understanding about their characteristics from the perspective of the sector that they are working and from the perspective of the formal and informal economic sector that they are engaged, they are engaged in. Benjamin, what we are seeing in terms of the mobility quite explains the fragility of our GDP that we've experienced since independence. Mm. If you look mm. at our GDP since independence, it has hardly followed what we call a steady state path. We've seen a lot of peaks and troughs with our GDP. And now, once we are looking at the data from the micro perspective, this is exactly what we are seeing. So even in terms of employment, we are seeing that fragility. We see where we, get, we have a lot of gains, as you rightly said. We have 78,000 people leaving the triple burden um, category. And in the next quarter, another 55,000 people going back. So we've seen fragility, vulnerability surrounding both our microeconomic indicators and our macroeconomic indicators. So the conversation now should be, how do we ensure that we make small gains, but have an increasing gain over time? Small gains, but sustainable ones. Uh, those are the steps uh, we need. To wrap the conversation, so uh, according to what you, showed, you told us, 7.5 million persons uh, remained employed uh, through the period that you assessed out of the about 11 million persons employed in each quarter. That would give a deficit of about, what, 2.5 uh, million. And you say this indicates that across the three quarters, about 3.5 million actually uh, were moving in and out of employment, depicting vulnerabilities. But a, a crucial point you made uh, in there, which you have just sort of re echoed, is that the purpose for this data collection is not just to add to the statistics, but to shape policy. What are your expectations, Prof, on the back of this data you've put out? It paints a picture when it comes to employment, unemployment, multidimensional poverty. And of course, like we've seen, the, the, the disaggregation of male to female unemployment. What is your hope having put out this information? I really look forward to some specifics um, going forward. The first has to do with our conversation around vulnerable employment. Benjamin, if you pick our coordinated program for economic and social development and policies, the agenda for growth, it highlights the issue of vulnerable employment it has a table, a figure, sorry, in the document with points to vulnerable employment as far back as 2013, putting a figure of two thirds of employment that are vulnerable, which has not changed 10 years on. So going forward, one of the specific things that we need to, I want to see, go, I want to see in our um, policy document is how do we, as I said earlier on, make an attempt to reduce these two thirds and consistently have a downward trend with vulnerable employment. The second specific that I wish to see going forward is our upcoming development um, agenda should clearly talk about issues of labor mobility, which is completely missing in the existing or the just um, run out development agenda. Because if you really want to transform an economy, you need to track people that are being absorbed by the different sectors you need to track people that are being moved in and out. So the conversation around labor mobility is hardly seen on the table um, of, for policy discussions. And going forward, I'm hoping that with these statistics that we've provided, that is, for instance, the 157,000 people that permanently remain unemployment, government will say that we want to have this. Services sector absorbing about 57.7% of those who were employed in the first quarter, but in the second and third quarters, they remain unemployed. We want to look at this. Seeing a lot more people transitioning out of the industry sector is clearly stated as, as a statistical target and as a country we want to see a change on that. And then the third dimension is the issue of persons that have multiple socioeconomic challenges. Again, 
if you take any of our development and um, policies plans, you'd hardly will see this number of 384,000 people who were multi that who, who were triple bedding, the, the number reduced and the number went up. So we've given government baseline statistics and we are hoping that this will be reflected as baseline figures in our statistical, sorry, in our development and plans and strategies. And then going forward, having targets on how and the extent to which we are going to reduce it. And speaking of targets, I also recall uh, those in the 21 age bracket and how crucial uh, they are to uh, future developments, especially those who may not be in employment and may not be in school. But it, what are your final words for us, uh, Professor Aini, right before we cap off the conversation? We need to sustain this conversation. As I keep saying, Ghana should be a statistical community. This is the only instance where we don't look at statistics. And Benjamin, sorry, I'm re repeating this. And I'll continue to repeat it until we see that change. We need to engage statistics as an input rather than engaging statistics as an output. We really need to use statistics to underscore our development plan so that at any point in time, if you're having a conversation on health, the first thing, Benjamin, you will call for is, let's look at a medium-term health policy document. And let's look at the extent to which we've achieved that. Mm. If you are looking at something on education, let's call for the education strategy document. Once you get that, you tend to the appendix where we have all the statistical targets. And let's begin to ask ourselves, what have we achieved? What have we not achieved? As we speak, we are not too clear on the SDGs that we can achieve and those that we cannot achieve. What we keep tracking is the number of SDGs that we are tracking. So to make Ghana a statistical community, my final word is that we need to sustain this conversation, and I'm always appreciative to the media coming on board, better understand what we do at GSS and bring policymakers closer to us. Prof, we are grateful, immensely grateful one more time that you've taken a chunk of your morning to answer these questions and to educate all of us basically on this latest report. We're grateful, sir. Pleasure. Thank you. And that is uh, Professor Samuel Kobina. Enim, he is the government statistician, letting us in on the latest dynamics as far as the uh, 2022 annual household income and expenditure third quarter labor force uh, report is concerned. Some interesting details in there. If you can grab a copy, you might want to read that as well. We're going to take a bit of a breather now. When we return on the AM show, there's a lot more coming your way. We still have to, uh, inter well, interrogate what has been happening in the Ghana Fire Service and uh, as they mark 60 years what the latest developments are, what we can expect from that outfit moving forward. All of that still to come on the AM show. Welcome back on the AM show. Now, the Ghana National Fire Service is 60 this year. What has the road been like? What has this journey been like for them? A few days ago, they were here in the studio, but there's a lot more that they have to share with us. My colleague, Mamiesi Nyamiche Thompson, is on hand to have that interaction with the Ghana National Fire Service. That is up next. A wonderful day today here and also a special day at the Ghana National Fire Service. There are a list of activities that are going to take place today. We are also expecting the Interior Minister Ambrose Derry. But to fill us in on what is going to take place, I have with me the Chief Fire Officer, Mr. Timothy Efum here, who is going to brief us on all the happenings that are going to go on. Mr. Efum, we are grateful for having us here at your headquarters, now, of course your office. Can you please tell us what to expect today? Thank you very much, but a bit of a correction. I'm Assistant Chief Fire Officer, oh. not the Chief Fire Officer. My apologies. That's okay. So um, we are having International Firefighters uh, Day celebration here. So um, we have two in one program today. Today is to recognize 
the efforts of our fallen heroes. So we are celebrating them today. We are recognizing their efforts because these are people who went in to save others right. and paid the ultimate price by losing their lives. Mm. And so we are remembering them, them today for all that they have done for Mother Ghana. Then the second part of the program is the Ghana National Fire Service is serving uh, 60 years this year. And so we are also taking advantage of this day to launch our anniversary celebrations. In fact, um, a list of activities to go on today. Um, you talk about those who've lost their lives um, in line of the duty. How many are we talking about here? We are talking about five, uh, or five uh, firefighters who lost their lives last year. Okay. So those are the people we are remembering today. Okay. Um, on your 60th anniversary, I mean, I just need to pick your brain on this. In the 60 years, how will you assess the operations of the fire service? I would say the fire service has performed uh, marvelously looking at the uh, handicap that uh, we have faced. We have never had uh, adequate equipment and the necessary logistics to perform. Right. But if you look at how we have performed, especially we go on international competitions and we place second, we place third. And so that uh, should tell you how the firefighter in Ghana performs. And so we as a nation, if we can equip the fire service adequately, then I think uh, the fire service will be number one in the world. Of course, of course. And um, so in all of this, we are expecting the interior minister to be here. I'm sure these are part of the um, request you'll be putting to him sure. to help the fire service be up on their game. But there have also been um, a series of uh, fire incidents, particularly one that caught national attention is the Kejitia market fire. Where are we on uh, investigations um, and report what you've collected so far? Um, so far, there is a committee in place set up by government and so uh, we should expect something from that committee. We did our part, but because there officially there is a committee in place, we cannot make anything public. So we are waiting for the committee. For them. Sure. All right. Um, would it take much of your time because we know that the event is just about to start and you're also expecting the interior minutes. But sure. before we go, what would you want to say right now to the people out there on your 60th anniversary celebration what's also uh, what the public should also be expected to do you know to help make your work easier right uh, what we expect the public to do is you see fire management is a, a shared responsibility and therefore as a service as we are doing our part you as the public must also do your part then we should we can have a whole fire protection system in the country if you the public you do your part and we as a service don't do our part then we will not have fire safety in ghana so also as we are doing our part if you also don't do your part we will not have a complete fire safety system so we i am urging every person in ghana to our uh, adhere to our educational programs if we come to you please have some five minutes for us listen to us and keep some in your head so that when emergency occurs you'll be able to employ what you have learned it is not during emergency that you learn what to do you must learn and keep it so that at emergency you then deploy what you know um, i will also urge Ghanaians that the firefighter is your friend if you have anything relating to your safety just get in touch with the fire station closer to your community and we are there to help you. All right. And so as you heard from Assistant Chief Fire Officer, um, you have to put your safety first and also and know that the fire service is your friend. We'll also be bringing you updates on what ensues here. But before then, um, we would like to tell you to stay glued to your television sets. We're bringing you more from here. I am Amir Sinyamichel Thompson reporting for Joy News.
Welcome back on the AM show. We're activating the phone lines to pick your thoughts on any of those matters that we've discussed this morning from the PIAC report to the Ghana Statistical Service uh, report. That is the, the annual household income and expenditure third quarter labor report. All the dynamics that we've had here. And again, the Ghana National Fire Service marking 60 years of existence. What is your take? Of course, if there are other matters, vexed issues of national concern that you would like to share with us, you are free to expand into those as well. The number to call, 0302 0302-211-691. 0302-211-691. Call us and let's get talking for God and country. For me, from that latest report from the Ghana Statistical Service, what really struck me, the fact that even on the back of the population and housing census, women are a tad more than men. Yet, where we find ourselves currently, they constitute two-thirds of the unemployment rate in the labor force. How come? Interesting dynamics. We have our first caller on the line. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Ben. What's your name? Where are you calling from? My name is Hamza from Ashaima. Who from Ashaiman? Hamza, Hamza, Hamza. Hamza, Hamza, thank yes. you for calling. What are your thoughts yes. for us? Um, I, my, uh, 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 ben, I just have a question to ask you. You know, our vice president has created over 2 million, 2 point something million jobs. But my question is, in which of the Ghana is he created? Is it the same Ghana we are living or is it different Ghana? Second is, who is in charge of statistics in Ghana? Is it an institution or is it? Uh, the vice president. If he is not in charge of statistics, he should leave that for the, the, the institution to do their work. And then stop coming out to, you know, put out figures. We, the figures are not verifiable. He should stop that. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza, for uh, sharing your thoughts on this matter. We'll pick a few more calls, just two of them. And then we'll call it a wrap. Uh, do we have a call on the line? 0302 is the number to call. 0302 is the number uh, to call. You can call and share your thoughts with me on what uh, you think about the different discussions we have had here this morning. That's the number at the bottom of your screens. When I engaged the government statistician uh, this morning, he also spoke about the multidimensionally poor. Uh, again, about those who have no job, they are not in school, not undergoing any training. They are also not in the workforce. So they are not contributing uh, to the national kitty, so to speak. We have Adams uh, on the line. Adams, good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you could speak up for me, I'd be grateful. What are your uh, good, thoughts for us? Uh, good morning. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the, the vice president issue, we have to, they have to be serious in, in, the, in the country. Sometimes when you, when, you, when you look at them speak, I think marvels you. I don't know whether... The vice president is the one controlling the economy, or the finance minister. It's like they've been contradicting information between the vice president and then the the, uh, the the finance minister. So they have to be serious about in this country. We need serious people to manage the country. So they should be serious in the country for it. Thank you. Thank you so much for calling, uh, bringing us to the end of the show. But of course. As I get even croaky at the end of the show, I'm going to need some Awake Purified uh, Drinking Water. And that's what I'm going to settle for. Now, Awake Purified Drinking Water is what the best you can find on the market. And uh, they are saying just stay awake with Awake Purified Drinking Water. They have the best sizes for all uh, occasions. 330 ml, 500 ml, 750 ml, 1.5 liters for those who always want uh, more. There's something else that is unique about Awake Purified Drinking Water. For every bottle you purchase, they make a donation to the National Cardiothoracic Center, and that is indeed heartwarming. It's another quality product by Casapreco Company Limited. If you want to purchase in bulk, just reach them on 0262 
251 This advert is FDA approved. Ghana for Thank you for joining us on the AM show. For God and country, my name is Benjamin Akako. But time now for me to knock off Uplext Joy News Desk. Do stay with us on this network.